Hi. So, I read bad books. This has been my hobby for a very long time. I don't shy away from it in real life. I'm always telling my friends about what I'm reading and interesting things out there from old books I've read and funny details. There's a lot to laugh at and my friends enjoy this, not to sound cocky. Um, online, I try to tend it a bit. I do, um, I do have a book blog, but I try not to talk about it all the time because the book community can be a very vicious, vicious place, more than I think people realize. You can talk about bad movies and had bad movie watch-alongs and all that, but uh, bad books are not treated the same way in any degree, and even the worst of books has some very, very vicious fans. So I cloak it a bit so I don't get completely mauled, and um, I, I will say I'm not a hater. I go into any bad book with a very open mind. I know that bad is subjective, and I've been surprised by f before. Like. I've read some books that I thought were absolute garbage that I thought, um, I looked at the cover and the description, everything about them, and I was like, this sounds bad, this looks bad, and then I, I loved it. I have loved some books that are absolutely looking like they would not be good. So when I pick up a book, even if I call it to my friends, even if I say, I'm reading a new bad book, if I love it, I love it, and I am not shy about just being honest with my opinions. And you know, even with really bad books, I mean, there's a joy in them. There's things that they actually get right or have potential. Um, sometimes a bad book will be badly written or there'll be a bad plot point, but the ideas there can be really cool. There might be even just a side thing that it's just, it can be inspiring, it can be just fun to think about. Like, there's plenty of good stuff. Books are complicated. And even if there isn't really anything good, there can be something silly, something fun. It's a way to bond with other people talking about them. I love bad books. I really sincerely do. And, um, well, this is about Light Lark. Uh, Light Lark is a, it's a book and it's a bad book. And Light Lark is a joyless husk beyond parody. It's a checklist of every island of blood and bone and glass and hearts and, um, every formulaic YA book that's come out in the last five years, both built and sold on tropes and aesthetic boards. This is a book written by an author who is not a writer, and it would fit in the dregs of an amateur writing site with eerie perfection. It would be on Wattpad, perhaps, and I don't even think it'd succeed on Wattpad, is the truth. It's... it's nothing. But Light Lark is a lot more than nothing is the only thing. Because Light Lark is a TikTok book. It was sold on and by that mysterious platform. You can still see the original pitch. Uh, it's a 15 second video. It's sort of just a slap shot of some basic like aesthetic images, you know, a guy holding a crown, a girl underwater. Uh, you see the author scrolling through a word doc proving that there are words in her book and she kind of does a hair flip. It's a perfectly fine pitch for a book. Uh, she's basically just saying, would you read a book like this? And, it's not really gripping to me, it's not quite my taste, but it sounds like a fine idea, really. Uh, but it went viral. It went very viral, apparently, and soon she had a six-figure deal, which is about $100,000 or more, for um, two books in the Light Lark world. It sold movie rights, too, which is pretty common in book deals, but only added to the hype. And the author, Alex Astor, was pretty big on bragging about this fact. She talks a lot about the success, the pre-orders, the love, the, the book deal, and the movie specifically, too. But here's kind of the twist to it, which is that, well, it's not really a twist if you read the title or um, know how TikTok or the world of books works. Um, Light Lark is bad. <laughs> not only is it bad, and I'm reading a whole review about it, in fact, this is an audio version of a review that I already wrote because it was so inconceivably long that I had to turn it into more than one format so that more people could engage with it. But not only is it bad, and I have a whole long review about that that you are here listening to, it also doesn't deliver what she promised. She hyped up a lot of this sort of spicy, which means, you know, ooh, explicit content, and specific scenes, specific tropes, and then when readers got the book, they found it was lacking that actual content. There were scenes and things missing, things that she promised in terms of ideas and tropes just weren't in there, she didn't deliver. She sold it on these tropes that didn't apply, so even her big fans were quite disappointed. And also the writing was very bad. People also started to really look at like her claims and how she sold herself online. A uh, key term is 10 years of rejection, for example. She very much 
presents herself as a self-made person. That she came from nothing, she struggled for 10 years, and this book finally went viral, and bam, there we go. But actually, she already had two middle grade books, and an agent already. Um, we aren't really necessarily sure. Her books seem to sell well, um, but they might not have sold as well as they could have. It was during the pandemic. And then she also had this obsession with Lightlark that lost her her agent. That's basically what she says. So she already had quite a bit, and she was already published, already in there, already had an agent, which is one of the most difficult first entry steps into publishing. And then she lost that because apparently she kept insisting that Lightlark should be made, and the agent wasn't accepting that. We don't really know the whole story. She comes from extreme privilege, um, many millions, basically, and her twin sister is a young businesswoman, particularly. Uh, she's a 30 under 30s businesswoman who's worth over 200 million just herself. She has businesses and all sorts of things. She's worked with celebrities. People accused Alex Astor, the author, of using nepotism or being an industry plant, which isn't true. Uh, nepotism is quite specifically using a connection, generally in the family a connection, to get something done or a position usually we don't exactly have proof that she didn't in any way, but also we have no proof that she did, and I don't believe that that was how she got this deal. Industry plant, too, doesn't seem to apply or be likely. Industry plant is being somebody who is presented as very self-made, but actually all of their actions and things are controlled by a company that is presenting them as self-made in order to sort of sell the narrative more. It comes from the music industry and in publishing, I don't know if we've ever notably definitely had an industry plant sort of thing, but I would say that she isn't that. But it can't be ignored that her wealthy background is, you know, it offers a lot of privilege. For example, um, and she admits to this, she has been living without debt. She's been living with her very, very wealthy family without debt. She went to an Ivy League school. Uh, it's something that a lot of writers can't afford to do, time or money. You know, let alone people can afford to do that sort of thing. And money does offer more opportunities for networking and advertising. It was fairly odd, too, and this is something people noticed, when many reputable, established young adult authors started promoting and praising the book. Um, you know, the front cover blurb, right on the front cover, Mary Lou, is like, you won't want to put this book down. Like, talking about how good it is, when... Well, the book is what it is, and so people started wondering if her, like, sister, who has connections to important people, got them the blurb, or, you know, publishers paid them off. You know, we don't necessarily have the exact true story about all of this, but all of it sort of raised a lot of alarms to people, and, you know, people slightly have turned on it. I don't really know the exact situation of things. The author, obviously, is just continuing to promote it and treat it as a huge success, and it has been a success and it hasn't been a success, and we'll really see if it's dead or on the water or not. It's still quite hard to say. It came out only um, last month, I believe, in August. Late August, I'm pretty sure. So it's still quite new. So, you know, that's the background of this book. I heard very suddenly about a very bad book causing drama online, and I went poking because that interests me. I saw early reviews and how they were negative and all of this drama and stuff, and I knew I had to hop on and actually look at the book. Because a lot of the reviews that you can see on it and much of the discussion is very much a couple excerpts of things and a little brief discussion of the drama, but very few people are talking about the actual deep inside of the book. And there is so much to discuss there. You will not be let down. I was not let down. Let's get into the review, and we're going to have to start in a lot of different places and cover a lot of things, but let's just start with the actual premise of Lightlark. Let me explain it to you entirely and tell you what it's sold on. So Lightlark is a young adult fantasy novel, um, and it defines itself in a bunch of specific ways. It sells itself in a bunch of specific ways, and pretty much everything it sells itself as is completely untrue and pretty much refuted quite early on even. So... Let me first start by reading the premise of the book, okay? This is the back cover text, basically. It's what you would pick up in a store and read and be like, oh, that sounds interesting. Every 100 years, the island of Lightlark appears to host the Centennial, a deadly game that only the rulers of six realms are invited to play. The invitation is a summons, a call to embrace victory and ruin, baubles and blood. The Centennial offers the six rulers one final chance to break the curses that have plagued their realm for centuries. Each ruler has something to hide. 
Each realm's curse is uniquely wicked. To destroy the curses, one ruler must die. Is the Crown is the young ruler of Wildling, a realm of temptresses cursed to kill anyone they fall in love with. They are feared and despised and are counting on Isla to end their suffering by succeeding at the centennial. To survive, Isla must lie, cheat, and betray, even as love complicates everything. Filled with secrets, deception, and romance, and twists worthy of the darkest thrillers, Lightlark is a must-read for fans of legendary fantasy writers like Melinda Lowe, Marissa Meyer, and Lee Bardugo. Yeah, so that's the short summary, and almost every detail of that is a, just a lie. It's untrue. Every 100 years, the island of Lightlark is accessible. It doesn't appear. It's not uniquely magical. It doesn't summon them. There is no game, there is no contest, and it is plainly and objectively not deadly in the slightest. The six rulers are not all hiding something. Each curse is far, far from uniquely wicked. A ruler dying to break the curses is not even in the central prophecy. The wildling curse is also not quite as it sounds. Rather, they go feral and try to kill whoever they fall with, in love with. I mean, maybe that the world clear... <laughs> The world building is unclear. It's so unclear, I'm stumbling over my words. And Isla, she does lie, yes. But can you really cheat if there's not really a game? And betray, I mean, she definitely doesn't betray. The book is something like a twisty thriller, you know, kind of, but not really. Rather, in the last few chapters, the main villain appears, gathers the characters together, and goes through a laundry list of twists, each one more inexplicable than the last some of which, which defy established rules of the world, and most of which make no sense. And the romance, uh, well, I'm excited to talk to you about the romance. There are two love interests, and romance is quite a stretch. One does the most, like, toxic, vile, messed up thing I've ever seen in a young adult fantasy like this. And the other, um, well, their romantic arc literally ends with them being flummoxed that they've fallen each other for each other, like, just totally and vaguely confused and shocked that somehow, apparently, they're in love now. So this is a tangled web of stupid curses, stupid powers, and the least amount of thought you can imagine. When I was in 35 pages in, I started explaining what I'd read so far to my flatmate, and it took me six hours, and I wasn't even done. <laughs> so, the plot. The plot of Lightlark. Well, before we can even talk about the plot, we need to go into the pre-plot. And I think that I'll start that section with a nice little teaser here where I'm going to give you a quote from the book. Cleo's blood hardened into ice before being seared by the fire. Grimm's blood became dark as ink. Azul's blood suspended in the air, separating into parts before finally falling. Celeste's blood burst into a mess of sparks. Oro's blood burned brightly before even reaching the flames. Page 32. So that's what we're, um, look forward to that. Lightlark, Lightlark requires both a sort of a complex timeline and an actual plot summary. I'm going to kind of mix them together rather than going strictly as the book reveals. Uh, Lightlark has this very nasty information of giving away very, like, nasty habit of giving away very little information on a diverse array of subjects. It's a high fantasy world, but rather than kind of info dump you, it's constantly offering a sentence or two of a new idea and then just kind of leaving you there. Everyone has a curse and power, but we don't learn what those are for a very long time. Uh, around 87 is when we finally learn the last of the six curses. And even then, the wording is vague and the powers don't really have a, any real explanation to a lot of them. In the very last few pages of the book, in fact, one kingdom gets a sudden new power where they can communicate through mirrors that has not been used or mentioned at all. Uh, much of the time, it feels like the author is making it up as she goes along, like thinking of cool abilities and trying, you know, ah, let's put that in and not at all trying to balance or plan them. But I will be going into that a lot more later. So plot wise, timeline wise, a long time ago, uh, long before the book starts, all six realms live together on the Isle of Lightlark. Each had a magic power tied to a natural element. So the natural elements being the moon, the sun, the stars, the sky, and um, the, the night, and yeah, the, the wild. It doesn't make that much sense, does it? Uh, all the celestial, you know, things up there, you know, sky stuff, and then nature, all of nature. 
the sky being different, of course, somehow being like the sky is its thing. And then separate from the sky is all the things that are in the sky. You know, night and moon are different, but sun and day are the same thing because there's no daylings. There's only the sunlings, but there are nightlings and moonlings. It, it's very strange. Okay. All of our realms here, we have, of course, a moon, sun, stars, sky, night, wild. They all need to have their own names, each realm. Uh, and rather than having like fantasy names, they have a little system to make it all easy for you. So here's the names and what people from them are also called. Moonlings, sunlings, starlings, skylings, wildlings, and nightshade. Why are they different? No idea. No answer given. Nothing. They're just nightshade. They're not nightlings, which they could be. Nightling is not more stupid than the other names. Who knows, you know? So anyways, everyone is happy together on Lightlark. But it turns out that Lightlark is an artificial island um, made by a sunling and a nightshade, and secretly a wildling, don't worry, working together. Um, of note, by the way, I mean, not an important note, but I just have to say the nightshade was named Cronin Malvir, which is the worst fantasy name I've seen since I recently encountered um, Conrad Kurz, and I that name is... So dumb to me. So the island of Lightlark was so powerful by being made artificially and so magical uh, that the Nightshade and the Sunling turned on each other and they dueled. And the Nightshades, like, he lost. So every Nightshade had to leave the island and they went and found their own islands. This was thousands of years ago. Each realm has a ruler, a ruling family line with extreme power. Rulers are linked to their realm. If they die, their power moves to an heir. If they have no heir... Everyone in their kingdom dies. Uh, rulers have an expectation that they have to continuously infuse their magic into their realm physically by, like, digging their fingers into it, or else, like, their realm will die. Rulers are so magical and powerful that they are quasi-immortal, unable to die of old age, though they do start to age in some way when they have heirs, so maybe they do die of old age eventually, but it's, it's unclear. Uh, around 600 years ago, uh, the Nightshade ruler decided to try and reclaim Lightlark, and Nightshade and Lightlark went to war for decades. Nightshade loses, but this doesn't have any impact on anything because it's not like Nightshade is now a colony of Lightlark or anything like that. No idea. They just they went to war, they lost, nothing changed. But after this point, uh, every ruler starts to meet together frequently for like just regular talks on the island of Lightlark. So 500 years ago, suddenly, the curses happen. Nobody knows why, and there's mass panic. The rulers of the realms don't know why this has happened or how it, you know, to stop it. So they go to an oracle, and the oracle tells them to commit mass ritual suicide in order to reveal a prophecy, as one does, and, you know, they do that. And so a prophecy is born, and I'm going to read to you the prophecy, and this is... Only joined can the curses be undone. Only after one of six has won, when the original offense has been committed again, and a ruling line has come to an end, only then can history amend. Yeah, uh, the rhyme scheme there, of course, being A, A, B, C, D, D. Uh, it's very bad rhyming anyways, but it, having that scheme of all things is also especially who. Yeah, the, the prophecy is the basis of the book, and it's infuriating. Uh, I have a whole section I'm going to get to after like I cover this plot summary to cover everything about the prophecy, why it's such a failure of a prophecy, of a plot motive. It's a bad prophecy, but they get this prophecy, they all commit suicide and get a prophecy somehow, don't worry about it. So along with all of the curses happening, a giant storm overtakes Lightlark, and every realm flees Lightlark and settles in new lands, not that far away. We know it's less than a month by boat, but it's unclear how far. Some people stay on Lightlark. Uh, the Sunling King is also the king of Lightlark, and he is bound never to leave. So all the Sunlings stayed. So do some people from most of the other realms. So starlings, moonlings, and skylings. Several thousand people from those realms stay on Lightlark. They just decide to. Uh, wildlings, every single wildling left, though. They're the only ones who totally left. Uh, we don't really know why the Sunling King, by the way, is bound to the island. Like, he is the king of Lightlark, yes. But if it has anything to do with the fact that he is, you know, part of the lineage that first created Lightlark, that's true, but we also know that Wildlings and Nightshades created Lightlark, and they're not bound there. Like, the Nightshades were exiled, okay, 
but the wildlings never were exiled. So why are they not similarly tied? Why did the sunlings get to just become the king and all the wildlings were like, it's cool. I'm going to talk so much about world building later. So I back to the plot. So every 100 years, the curse on the island lifts, and the rulers decide to use this 100-day period to hold the centennial, where they gather and try to break the curses. This has been happening for 500 years, with the book's plot considering the fifth year, or fifth ever, on the 500-year mark. Uh, the only guide to breaking the curses is the prophecy I read. It's not very specific, but the rulers have inexplicably, like, kind of come to some agreements on how it obviously must be interpreted. First, a ruler and their line must die, which will kill their entire realm. Uh, secondly, whoever breaks all the curses will win epic, unstoppable, godlike power. And you might be like, wait a second, I just heard the prophecy, I don't remember epic, unstoppable, godlike power. And yeah, you're, you're right, uh, it's, it's not in the prophecy, yet everyone refers to the prize of the prophecy constantly. It's a plot point, it's a major plot point, this vast, unpromised power that is never promised. Yet, of course, it still is true. How the prize is introduced is, well, here we go. Each centennial was a giant game, a chance to gain unparalleled ability. It was said that whoever broke the curses by fulfilling the prophecy would be gifted all the powers it had taken to spin them, the ultimate prize. Page 13, and yet, it was said. If it was part of the prophecy, it should be in the prophecy. If it's something the oracle tacked on after saying her prophecy, but she couldn't get it to rhyme, it should just be the oracle also said. It's just, it was said. They just assume. Who knows? So during the first centennial, all the rulers get together and everyone just tries to kill each other nonstop. No one successfully kills each other, uh, but a bunch of civilians died in the crossfire. So they had to set up some rules for the centennial. So rule number one, uh, no killing event, like no killing attempts until day 50. On day 25, you're going to get paired up and you're not allowed to kill your partner. Uh, rule number two, everyone has to attend all the official events. I mean, there's some parties and stuff to go to. And rule number three, no heirs. You can't have a kid to do this. If you break the rules, you forfeit the magical power the winner gets. It's worth pointing out again, um, magical power that the winner gets, not actually the prophecy, but whatever. That's the only forfeit. Also, the no heirs rule. So with looking at the no heirs rule and the fact that this was established, we can know for a fact that no one who's ever done the centennial has ever had an heir. That's what you have to agree to that. And if a ruler without an heir dies, their realm dies. There are still six realms. There always has been six realms. So thus, no one has ever died at the centennial, the event that is constantly being talked about, discussed, sold as, and everything as deadly. It is not deadly at all. It is objectively not deadly. No one has died. In fact, the most injury ever mentioned is uh, the main character once notes like one of her ancestors had her hand chopped off. So that's apparently the level we're working at. The rules don't make sense, really, the more you pick at them, but do kind of set up the structure of the plot. As the book story is very much a MacGuffin quest tied to a different MacGuffin quest tied to a very loose 100 day schedule, a lot of the structure is purely just a failure, but obviously we're gonna get there. And now before I actually get to the plot, here's a bit more pre-plot in that let's cover the curses and the powers of all of the different realms. Because it's very important and, well, it's extremely funny, so let's just go into it. So first off, we have the wildlings. Um, this is what the name implies, their power is wild related. So they can control plants and animals. They can make magic healing elixirs and magic elixirs of all kinds. Uh, they can grow forests instantly and cause plants to bloom instantly. They get animal companions. Uh, they have magical like seduction and beguiling. Non-magically, they're very hot and good singers. Uh, they also just spontaneously are generating gems. Don't worry about that. Cool, okay. Um, when a Their curse is that when a woman falls in love, she goes feral and tries to murder the person she's in love with. Also, they can exclusively only eat human hearts, one to two human hearts a month. So yeah, they get two curses. They're the only ones with two curses. I have thoughts on this, but also it's not explained. And yeah, they get two curses. It's great. Uh, they're pretty bad curses as curses go. Next up, uh, the Sunling, uh, the Sun People. Uh, they have uh, fire powers. They can control heat, fire. Um, really, really, really powerful ones can gild things solid gold. 
Uh, I haven't mentioned this. I should probably say they all have hair colors based on the realm, too. So, you know, they're golden hairs. Uh, yeah, great. They have less powers than the wildlings, but yeah, fire powers, cool. Uh, they're cursed. They can't go out in the sun or they die. Uh, the curses are meant to be sort of like twisted or wicked in some specific way. The book calls them wicked. Uniquely wicked is a term quite a bit. Uh, so the idea that they can't go in the sun, but they're called sunlings, it's supposed to be that they get their magic from the sun. So the curse of not being able to go into the sun to get access to their magic is a bad curse, apparently. But, you know, I'm, I'm not done covering curses because this is just the brief summary of curses. Nightshades. Okay, so nightshade, uh, they, you know, like sunlings, uh, they have the equivalent, they have mirror curses. So nightshades can't go outside at night or they die. And you might be like, why are you saying the curse first? That's breaking format. Let me tell you. Let me read their powers now. Remember, sunlings, fire powers, curse, can't go in the sun. Nightshades, can't go out at night. Shadow powers. Yeah, they have shadow powers. Yeah, okay, okay. Uh, they also can walk through walls, turn invisible, shoot beams of death, uh, create illusions, con uh, communicate, communicate via, via mirrors. <laughs> Messing up reading this. Uh, they can alter people's memories, create black holes, sense curses, cast curses, a long distance telepathy. They can do shadow magic. Yeah, okay. Uh, sense emotions, uh, project illusions directly into the mind, like rather than just a visual illusion, a mental illusion. So, you know, mirror curse is not mirror powers, huh? <laughs> Starling. Okay, so Starling, uh, Starlings are connected to the stars. So their powers are energy-based, whatever that means. They can shoot energy beams. Um, sparks are mentioned quite a bit, like sparks and fireworks. Uh, they also can do precise multiple object telekinesis. At one point, a man creates a dress for the main character in literal sec seconds, like... So fast, she doesn't even notice it, basically. It's just, she's wearing a dress. He cuts it off and creates a new dress with his telekinesis in literal seconds. She doesn't even notice the change. Strong. Uh, also, they can create solid swords from pure energy. And they have um, also their proprietary blacksmithing techniques. So not just they can create a sword of energy. They're also really good at making swords out of metal, apparently. So... You know, you know, they're really good at swords, apparently. And also, you know, they have telekinesis, so why are they wielding swords? So their curse is that they all die at the age of 25. And that is a real bad curse. The wildling curse, very, very bad. Every single person dying at the age of 25, also extremely bad. <laughs> moonlings. Uh, moonlings have water control, ice control. Uh, they have do magic healing. They're really cold resistant, presumably. Yeah, you know, water powers. Uh, their curse is that every full moon, anyone who is near the ocean is attacked to it. That is specifically near the ocean, not just, you know, vaguely near the ocean. It's like if you're on the beach, you're attacked by the ocean. Cool. Every full moon only. Skylings. Oh, Skylings. Oh, precious little Skylings. Oh, the poor little sky. Okay, so Skylings powers that they can control air and they can fly. Okay, yeah. You know what their curse is? They can't fly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uniquely wicked curses indeed. Twisted, dark curses. Horrible, <laughs> evil curses. Yeah, I I'm not over the Skyling curse. We get so little on them as their ruler is the least important character and just entirely unimportant in general. He's useless. And their curse is the one we learn last. They can't fly. How will they cope? I mean, wildlings, meanwhile, have two curses. Nightshades can do every friggin' thing because, you know, the main character love interest is one. Moonlings have a curse so pathetic, they can just hide inside and they're fine. Starlings can, you know... I mean, they die all the time. Look, compare starlings compared to the fact that nightshades and sunlings just have to hang out inside. Moonlings basically just have to hang out inside. Starlings, you just die at 25. You know, wildlings eating human hearts, of course, entirely unsustainable. Um, but you know, at least they're hot. Sunlings, at their most powerful, can gild things, but wildlings walk around and spontaneously generate gems. So many so that they're described as so plentiful in the wildling lanes that you trip over them. It's so uneven and bad. You can immediately tell who the main character and the love interest are, because obviously the main character is going to be a wildling. She's from the place where everyone's hot, and also the wildlings have comparatively much more powers than almost everyone else. Except for the nightshades. 
but then obviously her love sh- interest is a nightshade. She has a second love interest, and he's a sunling, but rather than being nerfed like sunlings are, he is something very, very special called an origin, which is never explained. And as an origin, he gets to use four realms as powers, because he has the powers of everyone who lives on Lightlark. Uh, so, yeah, you know, her love interests are all extremely powerful, and she's extremely powerful, and everyone who isn't part of those groups is very, very weak because they don't matter. Also on the subject of powers, there's flares. Yeah, there's something else that's called flares. So some rulers get extra special unique powers that don't match an elemental theme just because. And I mean, I'd argue, do they really match an elemental theme? Or a theme at all, really? Like, can you really say that Starlings creating a sword out of energy is elemental or otherwise theme to stars, let alone nightshades who can do everything. But yeah, no, there's flares as well. So the flares that we see, we see three of them. Uh, the flares being teleportation, uh, shape-shifting, and the ability to tell when someone is lying. So you can see how they're slightly less connected th- than fire and water powers, but honestly, you'd be surprised that nightshades can't just do all of them, because they They deserve more powers, if anything, you know? Okay, so, like I said, we're in the plot. Let's actually get to the actual, actual real plot of the book. As much as I can. So, is the crown... Okay, immediate diversion. No one else in the book has a last name. So we have to wonder if, like, it's like... Oro, King, Azul, Royalty, Grimm... Are they all, like, such thematic names? Okay. Is the crown is the young ruler of the wildlings. Her age is nearly two decades, so we'll say 19. Her parents killed each other, so she was raised by her two tutors. Her whole life, she's been getting ready for the centennial and training, becoming perfect at sword fighting, archery, knife throwing, sneaking, survival, endurance, dual wielding, fencing, lock picking, pickpocketing, seduction, charming, blending in, dancing, everything. Like, dear God, this girl can do everything perfectly. And her tutors have this plan where she'll seduce the king of Lightlark, who's also the king of the Sunlings, and then do what well, we never get step two. And you might be a little curious about this plan where she seduces the king as step one in this whole situation. And let me tell you something else about this world that is pretty important. On Lightlark, and maybe the world on a, as a whole, but also it could only be Lightlark, If you love somebody, they gain access to your magical powers, and they can use them, they can steal them. The book even says they can reject them, which I don't know what that means. So her seducing the king would be letting her steal his powers, and since he's an origin, and he has four realms worth of powers, that would be a lot of power. These terms and ideas are never super explained, but that's roughly it. Okay, so Isla, secretly, five years ago, Isla found a magic item she calls her Star Stick which we never get a description for, not even really a scale of size. So I fully encourage you to imagine a $30 princess wand from like Disneyland. She uses it to teleport. She's okay at using it. She uses it to also like sneak out and visit other realms. On one journey, she meets Celeste, the ruler of the Starling realm, and now they're BFFs. Together, they plan that during the centennial, instead of Isla seducing the king and all, they're going to work together to find a magic item called the Bond Breaker, which can apparently break any curse. Even the curses, which, if it was a well-known thing, you'd imagine more people would be looking for. But they know about it. They're going to use it to break their curses and then run away together to be BFFs. Yeah, so Isla arrives on the island and, you know, to the centennial. That's um, end of chapter one is her leaving. We get very little time beforehand. And she meets all of the rulers immediately. So let's just go through a really quick summary of all of them. Grimshaw, or Grim, is the always grinning nightshade. He's kind of just the darkling from Shadow and Bone. Obviously, he's a love and trust. Isla feels like they've met before. People blame Nightshade for potentially casting the curses because they have curse powers and don't like them. Grim embraces this by being very edgy and bland. Uh, He's, you know, about 550 years old or so. Here's a quote from him on the subject. He shrugged a shoulder. I'm the famed Nightshade Warrior. Thousands of kills on my blade. Everyone hates me. No one hates me. For good reason. They shouldn't. He peered down at her. You shouldn't. Page 179. 
grim. Uh, so then there's Celeste. Uh, Celeste is Isla's friend. She's the starling ruler. She's very loving and supportive friend. She kind of acts more as like a big sister. She will scold Isla for being naive. She has little substance beyond this. The two pretend not to know each other and sneak around to meet and plan, but the fact that they already know each other and are working together is never actually a plot point or a real thing of concern. Uh, Cleo. Cleo is the moonling ruler. Uh, most of my notes on her, I call her mean bitch because, not because the book called her that, not because I usually call people that, but because it's, it's very much just, like, that's all the author has given her as a character. I don't mean it as an insult. That's just all that is written for Cleo. She doesn't like Isla, and she's just sort of vaguely catty and evil for no established reason. She's also over 500 years old. Oro. Oro is the Sunling King, and that's also Lightlark's king. He has four kinds of power, uh, because Starlings, Moonlings, and Skylings stayed on Lightlark when the realms left, and that's apparently how his powers work. He's physically tied to Lightlark, and he cannot leave it. Uh, he's very cold and paranoid of other people, uh, and he is slightly dying because the curses have been going on for so long that Lightlark is dying. When Lightlark dies, he dies, because they're very connected. He's over 500 years old, at least. That's a bit of a theme. Azul. Azul is the Skyling ruler. He does not matter to the plot or world, and you can remove him entirely and his whole realm without consequence. Despite the fact the book really only has six main characters. Azul is a sad gay with a dead husband and that's it. He does have this really, really bad description when he first shows up, uh, which is on page 14 here. So that one of the first things I took note of when I was reading, in fact, a pale blue cloak cracked with wind before settling against bare, very dark shoulders and muscled arms. The man had eyebrows larger than his eyes, a sculpted chin, and perfectly coiffed stubble that framed his pink mouth. Yeah, very dark shoulders is my favorite phrase in that whole section, because very dark shoulders... I mean, it implies that his shoulders are very dark, but that the rest of him is not very dark, even though I'm pretty sure that the author means that he has dark skin. You know, most people, when I show that quote to them, they point out that stubble can't be coiffed. I assume he has some sort of crazy, like, the Hunger Games announcer guy stubble going on. But it's also worth, again, pointing out, like, he has gigantic eyebrows, or extremely tiny eyes, and the fact that his mouth is specifically said pink implies it is notably pink, because if you have, if you have pale skin, for example, your mouth is usually a shade of pink. It's, that's like a natural shade. If you have darker skin, it's not a shade of pink. If he has dark skin, but his mouth is called pink, it becomes a notable thing. So all I can imagine is he's wearing like bright pink lipstick. Who knows? So then these are all the rulers. Those are mostly our main cast, in fact. They go over the rules to the centennial and they sign a blood pact. The rules and prophecy define the structure of the book, basically. So in the first 25 days, each ruler has to hold a demonstration, which is sort of vaguely a chosen contest of one winner. On day 25, the person who won the most demonstrations gets to pair everybody up. For days 25 to 50, the pairs go around trying to fulfill the prophecy, which means, like, figuring out the original offense, because no one knows what it is, so they use those days to, I don't know, scavenge or hunt around. On day 50, murder's legal. On day 75, they hold a festival, murder's still legal. And day 100, it's all over. The plot is overly tied to 100 days. 100 days is a dramatic number, it fits the 100 years, but it's a very bad number. I never went and counted because I really couldn't be bothered, but probably like 40 days are time skipped over. Very often a chapter starts and we learn it's been five days or something, like dead time where Isla apparently has just been sitting in a blank white void while nothing in the plot progresses. It's, it's non-stop, but uh, okay. Before we get to the actual story in the centennial, we have to get Isla some new clothing. It's worth noting she of course teleported here and there's no reason she couldn't have brought a whole wardrobe with her, but yeah, she has to go buy some new clothes. And on the way, she bumps into Grimm, and they're immediately flirting and super into each other. Now, Isla has a secret. Of course, a deep, dark secret. She has no powers and no curse. So unlike other wildlings, she eats food other than human hearts, and if she falls in love, she won't go feral. This is her biggest secret, which she's always worried about the whole book. The other rulers are ancient immortals with immense power, except for uh, Celeste, in a contest where everyone keeps talking about murdering each other and the importance of murder. So she needs to not be an easy target, and having no powers, 
that's the easy target. So she lies about eating hearts. She has to pretend to have powers sometimes, once really. You know, this is a huge thing. And it's day two, and she has just met Grimm in like one short conversation, basically. And Grimm asks her, Heart Eater, can you have chocolate? Isla tried to keep the hunger off her face. I can eat my weight in it. That's uh, page 37. So immediately, she announces that she isn't bound to the only eating human hearts thing. A great job, girl. So the chocolate scene where Grimm feeds her basically a modern selection of artisan foods is actually perhaps the scene that makes me the most irrationally upset. It's a very dumb scene from the perspective of world building, and I have a whole section about it. But anyways, now we move on to the next phase of the book. The first 25 days and the series of games, or demonstrations as they're called. The Centennial is constantly like referred to as a deadly game, but objectively, not deadly, objectively, not a game. The demonstrations aren't games, and they aren't even part of the prophecy. They seem to only exist to fill time of the story and in narrative to decide who gets to pick pairs. Pairs being, again, an arbitrary decision not in the prophecy. They just decided to do that. In between the demonstrations, uh, just sort of weaving between, because I'm going to cover all the demonstrations in a row, but in between all of that, Isla and Celeste are planning to find the Bondbreaker. They break into a series of libraries all over the place. Celeste is the one who basically found this old book that mentioned it and said it was in a library. And Lightlark is divided into a series of miniature realms. There is Sun Isle, Moon Isle, Star Isle, um, Sky Isle, Lightlark Central, the Ruins of Wild Isle, and then the destroyed husk that used to be Dark Isle that might be in the ocean now. And each one has a library, so that's convenient. So before, though, they can even start looking for these things in all of the different libraries, Celeste has to procure a magic item made from skinned human hands to be able to unlock the secret libraries. Honestly, the mechanics of why and how that works is really not that important, so I'm not even going to cover it, but do you understand how, like, when I say it's very MacGuffin-focused? It's like a series of RPG quest markers. It's like... Okay, you need to find this magic item. To find this magic item, you need to search in five different libraries. To enter the libraries first, you need to search for a different magic item. Yeah, it, it's, it very much is just MacGuffin Central out here. The demonstrations, though. Let's, let's talk about the demonstrations. Uh, Grimm's demonstration is first. He gives Isla warning. Uh, it's a duel. Like, no powers, just sword fighting. I mean, maybe other weapons are allowed, but frankly, it's unclear, and they all use swords. The duel is one of the worst chapters in the book by far, from just like the armor she's wearing uh, to the weapons, um, the fighting is laughable. Uh, let, let me tell you a bit about, for example, her armor, okay? She's wearing metal shoulder pads, metal plated boots up to the top of her thigh, chain metal tights, and a breastplate that accentuated her figure. I, I don't... I'm not saying that if you're going to have armor in a book, you need to know all the names for parts of armor. Some people probably say, yeah, you probably should. I'm of the mind that honestly, you can say armor and you can just be like, it's armor. Or you can say armor and specifically mention things that I consider to be pretty widely known, like greaves and gauntlets and pauldrons, the shoulder bits, you know. You can't sort of do this thing where you say metal shoulder pads. Chain metal tights. These are the wrong words for things that already have words. And then the weapons. So Oro wields a sword and armor made of solid gold. I understand what the author means. She means that they are shining gold. They are maybe plated gold. They are made of a material that looks like gold. They are not solid gold because rather famously, and again, I consider this a very well-known fact, but also something that happens if you Google, Gold is a really breakable metal. It's it's soft. It's legitimately a soft metal. It cannot be used to make a sword particularly well. It's also extremely heavy and unwieldy. It's, it's not a good material. So the fact that he is said to have a solid sword and armor... No, he doesn't. <laughs> Meanwhile, Azul has a sword that is covered in random gems, just covered in gems head to toe, which gilded... And, um, you know, decorated swords like that exist, but usually they are decorative. And if you're wielding in combat, it just wouldn't be very aerodynamic, depending on how it's made. It, it's not very practical the way it's described. And then Grimm. Grimm has a broadsword thicker than her thigh. 
which has multiple issues in it, again, right away. First of all, broadsword. She, the author here means wider than Isla's thigh. Thicker is that. Wider is that. I know I, gesturing with my hands is going to really help here. Look, it, it's, a, it's a completely different concept. His sword is not thicker than her thigh. That would be several inches thick, which would be the worst weapon. And it's not wider than her thigh either, unless she has stick, stick, literal stick thighs, because a broadsword, it is broad. But it's not like a JRPG buster sword where it's ridiculously large. Like, you can look up what a broadsword looks like. It's not actually that broad. It's a couple inches across, but really not that many. It's just, uh, yeah. No care or research went into this book. The fighting itself, again, laughable. Isla is described as charging up attacks. Um, you know, it, it sounds like she's in Legend of Zelda. She does a leaping, like, finishing move where she leaps into the air suddenly and strikes down. You know, Oro beats Azul in literal seconds with barely anyone even seeing the action. But Isla beats him and Grimm very easily thanks to the power of, um, abuse is what I would say. So here's a quote where we get to learn why Isla is just extra, extra good at sword fighting. His strategy was to tire her, to use her energy on taking his hits instead of making her own, until her arms gave out. She almost smiled. She didn't know, he didn't know that when Isla was 12, her tutor had left her hanging onto the branches of a tree, 50 feet above the ground, for five hours. The first hour wasn't so bad. She had been training for a while at that point. Her arms were strong. By the third hour, she was screaming. By the fourth, her voice gave out, but the fifth, one of her shoulders had popped out of its socket. She never let go. And that's 55. So, okay, I, I have many things to say on just that one section, because, oh my gosh. Okay. First of all, it's pretty much impossible for anyone, let alone a 12-year-old, to hang from a tree for five hours, pretty much. I'm... Like, I'm not going to look that up myself, you know, as much as I lament the book for doing research. It doesn't seem very likely, especially for a 12-year-old. You know, but the thing is mostly, though, muscles don't work like this. Muscles don't have EXP bars that you, like, train up in one big endurance bout. It's like, she did this once, and oops, her muscles are now level 999. So she can beat the 500-year-old warrior easily. And if anything, this would probably cause permanent damage or severe damage. There's a reason athletes today aren't all just hanging on trees for hours and thus instantly become invincible. It's also a deeply bad message. The message here is the abuse made her strong. The book says that point many times. It doesn't call it abuse. It says, you know, Isla's tutor did this and this to her, and it's something like, left her blindfolded in a hurricane to navigate her way back over several weeks and things like that. This tree thing, but it's, it's an abusive thing. She was controlled, sheltered, and abused and raised for the centennial. And, you know, that, you know, would that give you some skills if you were nonstop put through training? I guess. But the message of the book is much more just like, the reason she is so powerful and strong is because she was abused. At least, like, three times, Isla is like, little do my enemies know, I was forced into horrific tortures by my tutors, and thus I am very powerful. And it's almost like a smarmy, like a surprise twist sort of thing, not what it actually is. Okay, second demonstration. Uh, Azul's demonstration is a showing of power. Just the most impressive power show wins. Grimm shows an illusion of the room shattering and being destroyed. Cleo makes a shark out of wine. Celeste makes fireworks. Azul makes some clouds. Oro turns the table into solid gold, and Isla throws a dagger blindfolded at, at a target, Oro's crown, and everyone is really impressed, so they don't even notice that she didn't use magic. Oro wins because apparently turning a table into gold is like the most impressive display of power possible, even though it sounds the least interesting. Celeste's demonstration is this magic fear mirror. She has a magic relic, and yet yeah, relics and enchantments are not explained. They can just do whatever. That when you touch it, you face your biggest fear. You can only touch it once, though. So this kind of sounds like an interesting potential. It's sort of like the, um, the Bogart scene from, you know, 
that franchise, but somehow the author just completely screws it up. Instead uh, of like it being something everybody witnesses that you must fight your fear in some way, each ruler goes in turns to touch the mirror. It takes two to six minutes each and happens entirely in their head. God knows what everyone's doing in the downtime. I assume awkward small talk, staring awkwardly. Cleo wins this one. So Isla's demonstration is whoever can like show off the most useful thing that their realm can provide to the people. Like, you know, like Shark Tank or something. So Azul shows how controlling the wind can deliver mail. Cleo just says, we have a lot of boats. And she says that in a very threatening way because she's a villain. She's evil. Celeste shows how 12 starlings can work together to turn energy into a single metal sword. Oro makes balls of harmless eternal fire anyone can carry around safely. Grimm says his realm has nothing productive. Isla shows off wildling, he wildling healing tonics, and Azul wins. And that is wild, because Azul is like, hey, I can, if you fold mail into paper airplanes, I can use wind power to deliver that over distances. And that's cool and all, but like, Oro has eternal fire that anybody can carry around, like eternal lighting, that probably is immune to, um, yeah, it would be immune to weather, he says. While Isla shows off a wildling healing tonic where she literally sticks her arm into a fire until it like burns to shreds and then she pours the tonic over it and it heals in seconds. And it hurts a lot, obviously, but it is an amazing healing tonic and apparently that is less useful than the male, so that's cool. Cleo's demonstration is um, really, really vague. I, I don't know quite what it is. It's an ice mage. Ice maze full of freezing water you swim through, vaguely following your desire to find the end. Uh, the description of it really doesn't make sense and doesn't reflect the end result. Uh, here's, here's what Cleo says. You will be guided through the maze by your own heart. It will lead you to what you desire most. The winner will be decided not by their desire, but who can reach it first. For worse than desiring something above the good of one's realm is not being sure of what you want at all. That's page 110. So... Isla swims in a freezing maze and she kind of gets like hypothermia or she, she gets really frozen because it's an ice cold maze. Her heart desire and all of that sort of stuff are entirely irrelevant. Uh, notable, of course, Isla is from a tropical climate. Uh, she's never even experienced winter. So her swimming in an Arctic maze and not immediately getting shock and drowning is silly. She then goes and treats her freezing with scalding hot water, which will literally actually kill you with shock. You know, this and things like the armor and um, this one other scene where Isla says that falling from 50 feet might break her legs or ribs rather than 100% killing her, which it would, shows the immense lack of care and research in this book, just all around. The final demonstration is Oro's demonstration. It's a tea party. A deadly game indeed. He ser serves everybody three cups of tea. You know, three different teas and three different cups, okay? For some reason. And then he announces his demonstration has begun once they've drunk all of it. Rather than being some sort of, like, logic puzzle or poison thing, because, again, why is it split over three cups? He says it's truth tea. And rather than it being a tea that makes you tell the truth or whatever, it's tea that spells your greatest secret across the empty cups and tea leaves. Between three cups, too, which is extra weird. The challenge is whoever says their greatest secret wins. Everyone, like mischievous little kitties, pushes their teacups one by one onto the floor. Oro is the last one left, and he announces his dark secret. He also pushes his cups onto the floor. <laughs> like, think of your serving staff. Okay. It leads to this really famously quoted scene, because it's very silly, so let me... My back is breaking. Uh, his life... His... <laughs> his eyes were lifeless as he stared down at the first cup. I, he let it fall to the floor. The second, am. For the third, he looked up and caught Isla's eyes. He frowned a bit, as if disturbed his gaze had shifted her way. But he did not look away as he spoke the third and final word of his greatest secret. Dying. It's 131. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, extremely dramatic, and the whole time he's just, whoop, whoop, just kind of tossing some teacups onto the floor. Now we enter phase two, pairing up. Light Lark Island turns into Love Island as the winner, Oro, picks the pairs. He puts him and Isla together, which surprises everyone. Isla and him don't really like each other. 
And this is the first time on page 135 the central prophecy is ever said. I read it earlier so that you could keep it in mind how bad a prophecy it is and how their actions at this point don't correlate to it. They mention it a lot though, especially how, you know, it says a realm and a ruler must die and the centennial is all about who is the right person to die, who deserves to die. Yet we wait this long to ever actually see the prophecy in full. In fact, it's not even quoted partially, it's just never said what it exactly says. The prophecy is so core it should be on page one as a prologue. Obviously, like clearly. So, when we pair up and enter phase two, we find a new MacGuffin quest to kill time, because the Bondbreaker quest isn't going so well, so we need another MacGuffin quest. Oro takes Isla to a cave and explains how it contains every single plant on Lightlark. He also warns of ancient creatures that hate wildlings for abandoning Lightlark and might try to kill her. He has heard of a magical relic known as the Heart of Lightlark, which blooms once every 100 years in a different location, always looking different. It is always attached to another living thing, so he wants her to point at plants that would make good hosts. She identifies three. A purse plant that safely holds living things, a coffiner tree that traps living things, and a water lily. So now that's what happens. Isla and Oro, for days and time skips, look for the heart. They find a field of the purse plants and spend days opening every single one. The chapter after is literally called Second Place as they go to the second place and spend days in a field of coffiners opening every single one. Isla and Oro kind of bond, but they still kind of hate each other. Oro's very closed off and doesn't share much information, usually being rude. Isla is very rude and finds him insufferable, usually calling him a wretch the whole time, which sort of becomes like a fun pet name, wretch. Oro gives like some snippets of lore and all of the snippets of lore don't make any goddamn sense as you'd expect. Okay, here's one. This is Oro speaking first, because I'm not a voice actor. I'm not even a reader. L listen to me stumbling over words. Do you know why killing isn't allowed until the 50th day? He looks so upset she didn't dare form a response. It's because choosing the right ruler to die is the difficult part. Not just because we would be sentencing thousands to death, but because all of our futures depend on making the right decision. Even if we did know for certain the offense that needed to be committed again, the decision of who needs to die would be nearly impossible. That, more than anything, is why the curses haven't been broken until now. Page 167. So, uh, yeah, here's the thing. Oro says the hard part is the decision on who should die. But let's look at the centennial, which has happened four times now, with four of the rulers being the same immortals. The first one was literally just trying and failing to kill each other. None of you have discovered the original offense. If picking the right person matters, why allow killing at all until you've decided this? It's part of stuff I'll cover when I get to the prophecy. <laughs> On the same page, Isla asks why they don't just kill Grimm, as he's the most hated guy at and realm. She likes him, but nobody else likes him. Uh, they had a war and everything. They're, they don't even live on Lightlark. Yeah, why don't we just kill Grimm, she asks. And uh, Oro offers this. <laughs> Grimm is the only thing standing between us and a greater danger you can't even begin to fathom. Page 167. Yeah, thank you. Wow, thanks. Okay, she asks Grimm about this exact thing, and he also shakes her off with a, I don't want to distract you with that information. And so we never learn what this thing is. And if it's so important, this greater issue, evil, whatever the heck, that's so greater than the curses that we cannot kill Grimm, why isn't one of the rules central to the Lightlark centennial thing, don't kill Grimm, we need that guy. We don't have anything left. If he dies, we're apparently doomed to some mysterious other thing. Don't kill him. And yet, that's not a rule at all. So, okay. After searching the second place, Oro decides they should go talk to an ancient creature. They keep using the term ancient creature, but do not explain what that means. The book very much feels made up as it goes along, and the fact ancient creatures are only mentioned on page 134, at the start of this kind of part two, really suggests that. Ancient creatures suddenly appear, exist in the plot, and don't matter at the end. It's very shoddy. So what is an ancient creature? When I heard the title, I thought like a unicorn or a dragon. They're talked about as dying because Lightlark is dying and they're very tied to the land. They hate wildlings because wildlings totally abandoned the island when the curses happened. They're ancient creatures. I mean, 
Okay, let's see. We, we hear quite a lot about them before we get any sort of answers. And uh, here's Oro giving a warning to Isla about ancient creatures right before they go to meet one. They are tricksters. I usually was doing this in a voice and then I got an awkward pause. I remembered I wasn't remembering. They are tricksters. Some are more violent than others. Some will eat you for dinner and pick their teeth with your bones. Others are more scheming than murderous. They are as old as the island itself. It's 195. Uh, yeah, okay, at this point I thought, okay, these are, these are fairies. Fae, you know, fae and fairies are slightly the same, slightly different. They're very hot in YA. And they fit the description pretty well, except I wouldn't call Faye a creature. Usually you call them a folk, in fact, quite importantly, because they're more people and creature sounds more like an animal. But they're not fairies. Um, it turns out the ancient creature is a ghost. Okay, uh, ghosts exist now. Oro has made a deal where the ghosts can possess Isla's body for a few seconds in exchange for information on where the heart is. Isla's pissed off about this, but agrees in exchange for, like, library access for the Bondbreaker quest. The ghost does so for, like, a couple seconds, and then says, hey, the heart isn't on Star Isle, which doesn't really help at all. Uh, Isla goes to the Sunling Library for Bondbreaker, doesn't find it, so not really anything is moved along. In between this whole section, there's some filler, like, Grimm and Isla are very horny for each other. Uh, Cleo, at one point, sends assassins after Isla to kill her, before legal murder is legal, for completely unclear purposes. But, yeah, this, this whole section especially is completely dead in the water. Okay, now we're on to section three. So section three, murder is legal now. It's day 50, and day 50 is a ball, because of course it is. What is YA fantasy without balls? The ball is called the Betwixt Ball, which is just kind of made me laugh. Lightlark has one of the worst ball scenes I've ever seen, which is weird because it's really not that hard. You write a lot of lavish descriptions of dances, decor, atmosphere, outfits, like, yeah, a good ball scene is hard, like, good writing is hard. But to convey the idea of a ball successfully, it's not too hard to hack that. And Lightlark doesn't nail it at all. The party scene is very short and glossed over, and we basically get, like, no details about anything. It was really surprising, honestly. Her outfit's quite wild, though. Let me tell you what she's wearing. Precariously placed leaves trailed across her chest and along her stomach, leaving strips of skin exposed between her ribs. Across her lips. <sighs> I really do apologize. I'm not a great speaker, and um, I don't usually do very, very long reads. I'm trying my best. Precariously placed leaves trailed across her chest and along her stomach, leaving strips of skin exposed across her ribs. The green leaves continued down her middle, just past the top of her thighs. Below there was just sheer material, the occasional leaf sewn into the tumbling fabric. Her cape was deep green and offered at least some sort of modesty. It also hid her weapons, throwing stars disguised as brooches, blades tucked into the folds. Chain mail was stitched into the fabric, making the cape into a shield. It's 208. Just her sexy, skimpy leaf outfit that also hides ninja stars, multiple swords or I guess knives, and the cape is made of chain mail. Yeah, I mean, I haven't brought this up yet. An important fact about the book, unimportant but very, very important, is its cape obsession. Everyone is wearing a cape, a variety of capes. It's never a cloak, it's always a cape. At the ball, we learn almost nothing about the other ruler's clothes. We do learn Azul is wearing a cape made entirely out of gems, and Grimm is in a nicer version of his regular black suit with a shining cape. Capes are everything in this world. Fashion does not exist if you're not in a cape. What's the point? At the ball, uh, there are six staircases, and the rulers basically descend at once down into, like, the ballroom. What's meant to be this glamorous, powerful moment just sounds messy and tacky. It's described like this. Snow fell in sheets from clouds that crowded the glass ceiling. Shadows danced along the walls. Trees grew from the marble floor. Silver stardust was smeared like paint down the stairs, and dozens of rings of fire hung above their heads. Isla knew what to expect but it was still magnificent. It's 209. So, yeah, it's trying to combine a bunch of elements of all of the ruler's powers, basically, in a big ballroom. And instead, it's just a bunch of things that don't feel connected at all. S paint is smeared on the stairs? That doesn't sound really pretty. The obvious theme is the fact that everybody but the wildlings are celestial-themed. It should be like the whole ballroom is enchanted to look like a 
beautiful field of stars or something with the moon, the stars, you know, the sun is also there. It's like dawn and dusk. Uh, and you can have the wildlings in there as like dark shadowy trees or something all around the edges or growing from the floor. Not to provide help to this book that's already out, but that makes so much more sense. It would look way cooler than what they describe. Anyways, uh, Isla and Grimm meet up at the ball and he takes her to like a dark portal that's never explained because they just sort of get distracted being horny for each other. They haven't kissed yet, but he just sort of feels her up and then, you know, stops to give her a magic necklace. It has a black diamond the size of a small potato, real words, and turns visible. And if she tugs on it, he'll run to her aid. Suddenly, the castle starts to collapse. The island is dying after all the curses. So Oro falls unconscious, and Isla picks him up, slams him against the wall violently, and yells at him to get up and stop this. Is this romance? Because remember, he's a romantic lead. Anyways, like, 20 people die, so overall it's a win. Oro and Isla go to another ancient creature, because we're not done with this heart quest at all. The heart quest is now the plot of the book. These ancient creatures are not ghosts, they are blue-winged bug people who live in a giant hedge lattice that is never explained. They attack, lightly slit Oro's throat, and our heroes barely escape. Oro is unconscious, and Isla needs to get him to water so he can heal, so Isla violently slaps him awake. Is this love? Is this romance? I don't know. They bond a bit. Uh, he says he thinks the original offense was using the heart, which is super magical, and that's why he's looking for it. He also says when they win, she can have all the magic of the prize, the godlike power that's definitely, definitely in the prophecy, if she just tells him her greatest secret first. She refuses. Yeah, so they go to track down the oracles. So these are three ladies frozen in ice thousands of years ago because they can tell the future. They don't like being frozen in ice, though, like it's a whole thing. The oracle tells them the heart is on Moon Isle, which is Cleo's land. There are like three places on Moon Isle to search, to, so they get started the next day. It's not that much urgency, you know, Oro's only dying. Isla at this point uses her star stick to make a portal, and she can apparently just gaze through the portal she makes of her star stick to just check in on her home island. And oh no, it's dying like crazy. It's basically just like a burned out shell of itself. She then is compelled to go tell Oro her greatest secret so she can get all those imaginal powers and such. So she tells Oro that she doesn't have powers, and yeah, you know, um, he is kind of shocked, but she just runs away before anything can happen. Uh, the next day, it's day 60, Oro calls a progress meeting. This is wild, because they should have been doing this all along, but inexplicably in the midst of murder is legal time, they just have a boardroom check-in to see how everyone's doing on breaking the curses. Oro decides that they should also pick new partners here. I mean, it is all arbitrary, the partnership anyways, and he picks Cleo. And when he's justifying why he's switching partners, he reveals Isla is powerless. This is a huge betrayal and she freaks out, but Grimm grabs her and teleports her away. Grimm says he's always known Isla doesn't have powers because nightshades can sense curses. And she is so blown away by the fact that he's always known she doesn't have powers that she's like, he is obviously trustworthy, sincere, lovely guy, great, not using me at all. You know, and he says some really dumb, edgy Pinterest lines. Um, <laughs> the, uh, the most offensively <laughs> edgy, dumb lines. Okay. Grim grinned at her. It was unnerving the way, even in this moment, it made her insides puddle. Because we're monsters, heart eater, he said. Or at least that's what they think. His grin widened. And monsters stick together. It's at 249. Isla hides out in the ruins of the old Wildling Isle, as the palace there has an enchantment that nullifies all magic but Wildling magic. That's super magical, that's super magical, yeah, it's super powerful and super useful. And doesn't, we don't know how enchantments work, so I really can't nitpick this too much, but if you have power like that, why doesn't, like, every single isle have the same enchantment? It sounds very useful. She spends a week sulking and doing nothing, a whole week, because we have a hundred days to fill. She has some really horny dreams about Grimm and assumes that he's sending them to her, but um, he denies that. Celeste has to come and yell at her to stop sitting around and doing nothing. So Isla writes a letter to an information-dealing villager offering to trade her biggest secret for his. So, interesting. Um, her biggest secret is not really a secret anymore, but he says, you know, hey, that sounds great. I'll totally take your biggest secret. Mine. I know who casts the curses. Wow. 
No one knows that, so why is he hoarding this for 500 years? He is a Skyling, so I guess he just thinks like, ah, not flying doesn't, you know, it doesn't hurt my life that much, and I fucking hate my neighbors, so I won't share this very important information with anyone. However, when Isla goes to meet him, she finds Cleo has murdered him. So she doesn't get information on who cast the curses. And she decides thus, Cleo definitely cast the curses in the first place, not only killing this guy to cover that up, but also the fact that the Moonling curse is the most livable. Which it's not, that would definitely be the Skyling curse. And also, Cleo's very mean. Isla follows Cleo for no clear reason, just kind of, oh, she's evil, so I'm going to follow her around. And she winds up encased in ice. Oro saves her uh, at this point, very conveniently before she can die, and explains he outed her powerlessness for only good reasons. He had to get Cleo to trust him so he could search for the heart in places only Cleo could reach. Also, to monitor Cleo. Also, because Cleo wanted to kill Celeste, uh, which the starling, and by revealing Isla's powerless, this spread doubt in her mind on who the best person to kill. Also, Oro was guarding Isla the whole time. Also, Oro has never lied to her, and in fact, has a secret flare power where he can tell anyone is lying. And that's despite the fact Isla was constantly lying to him. Also, if Cleo wanted Isla dead, she would have just done it rather than freezing her. Basically, Oro was right in every single way. And don't get me wrong, Isla is very annoying and I'm not on her side really. But definitely the amount of right Oro is sort of invalidates all of Isla's reasonable complaints about being outed as having no power against her will. At this point, we enter day 75. So yeah, if you're keeping track at home, day 50 to 25 period, the main events are that is more MacGuffin running around for the heart, the reveal of the powerlessness, and that's kind of it. It really does just sort of fly by and not anything of note happens. Definitely not any real murder attempts, which is, you know, the whole point of it. So we're on day 75. We had a ball on day 50, so now it's time for a festival. The festival is called Carmel, I don't know why. This is the start of the climax, and it's gonna really go off the rails. Uh, Isla drinks some wine and gets drunk at the festival. She goes to Bond of Oro more. Suddenly, big news! Celeste has been poisoned by something. It's entirely vague. Let me read it. Celeste floated in the middle of a miniature maze, looking a lot like she was sleeping. Silver fog and string, thin as spiderweb, wrapped a thin veil around her. 280. Luckily, like, the poisoner was interrupted, so she's dying, not dead. I don't know what sort of poison makes you float in the air like this, but don't worry about it. And don't worry about this plot point either, it isn't one. It's resolved off place by sheer convenience and doesn't matter. Grimm randomly finds an ancient super powerful healing potion in a shop that cures Celeste instantly. I'm a little bit, you know, off page even. It's just like, hey, Celeste is fine now. Yeah, I... I I don't feel like I even need to tell you who did the poisoning, because it's not important, actually. <laughs> so, Isla and Oro go looking for the heart more. Isla gets attacked by an ancient creature again. This one is a mermaid. They continue not to find the heart, but we do learn, like, Isla, for example, is a virgin who hasn't been kissed, and this is going to be really important. <laughs> so, Isla and Oro then go looking for the heart more. This time they get attacked by, not an ancient creature, but the Winterlands. I'm pronouncing that. In definitely not how it's um it's like winterlands but it's um i think it's more germanic with a v and a d instead so vinderlands but the vinderlands is how i'm going to use it so they're basically wildlings who renounced being wildlings thousands of years ago and now are feral and roam, roam moon isle and eat hearts for fun not because they have to for some reason you know not hinted at not important to the world See again, like, the plot feeling extremely made up as it goes along. The heart isn't here either, you know? They've searched everywhere. Celeste is still poisoned. Oro's dying. I mean, whatever will they do? So, three days pass. Because it's urgent. They then go to basically look in the original book where Oro first learned of the heart. Uh, what they know of the heart is that it blooms where darkness meets light, and the heart is hidden until it blooms and becomes part of lark light when it is needed most. Which is around 297 as a quote. So yeah, they, they check up the exact definitions there, it doesn't help much. Uh, we also here learn that the secret of the lark... <laughs> this secret of lark light, light lark, and I'm gonna mix those names up a lot probably, and I maybe already have. We learn the secret 
that isn't a secret, which is that Lightlark was made by a Sunling, Nightshade, and uh, Wildling all working together. Well, the common history is that Sunlings made the island alone. Oro says that the heart can only be found and used by someone from those realms, which citation needed. We hear about the book and where he first heard reference of the heart, and there is no quote on that subject again. Yet he is positive of this, and of course, like all things, it will turn out to be true because the book tells us it. Great. So Isla and Grimm meet up. She's initially upset with him about how he told her Lightlark was made by a Sunling and a Shadowling, but he didn't mention that a Wildling was involved. He, she asks if he has any more secrets, and he asks, really shady. She's like, you do, huh? Tell me. And he changes the subject entirely to distract her by being, you know, really horny and spoking, speaking in these really overdramatic, super cheesy lines. Okay. You have invaded my mind. I have questioned my sanity. I think about you all the time. Late at night, I ache for you. I ache for you all the time. He said, face truly tortured. Page 300, calm down, like calm down, rein it in, rein it in, Grim. So they kiss and he fingers her against the wall for a bit and she totally forgets about him being suspicious. Now from here on out, she's just sort of basically in love with him. It's not really love, it's kind of more lust, but yeah, she's totally into him. Isla suddenly, God knows how, announces to Oro she knows where the heart is. It makes no sense. It tries to have been foreshadowed, but it was not foreshadowed. And it's a bit offensive that the book lies to you and says this was foreshadowed. It is not. When she went to Moon Isle, she kept getting attacked and harassed by a large bird. She thought it was Cleo's, like, pet bird. And suddenly she's like, this isn't Cleo's pet bird. I don't know why she suddenly decides this, but she's positive that if she follows it, she will find the heart. She figures the um, darkness meets light location means dawn or dusk, which makes sense. And that despite the constant use of the heart blooming, it is actually connected to uh, an egg. And it is connected to an egg. So here's a quote. Um, In the rising light, Isla noticed something. She squinted. Right below the nest, something was floating in the air, untethered to gravity. Is that an egg? She asked. Just as the words left her mouth, the egg fell, slowly, too slowly, it plunged to the ground and cracked open. From its shell emerged a shining gold yoke. It rose from the ground in tandem with the sun rising from the horizon, just across the cliff. The full moon represented the egg, she said. The yoke is the sun. How many times had she thought the full moon looked like an egg? That the sun looked yolky? 311. Yeah, the, the heart the heart is indeed a glowing orb of power that floats in the air like a video game power-up. And the yoke thing is odd. The book, like, I've definitely seen other people call the sun a yoke. It kind of does make sense. Um, the book does it and it stands out, but it's not so much that it's like, that's insane. One of the most shared quotes from this book, though, is actually her calling the sun yolky. And everyone's like, that's kind of ridiculous. And what's even funnier is that that is foreshadowing, allegedly. So yeah, she does use the term and compare the sun to a yoke multiple times. Two times, that is. And she never once calls the moon an egg. The book is just lying. It's just lying, okay? Suddenly, Isla is shot through the heart and the Winterlands are to blame. She is rushed to the palace and the heart magically heals her. This is where Grimm shows up and says he conveniently also cured Celeste. Okay, cool. With the heart, Oro and Isla discuss now who has to die to break the curses because they've done the games, they've repeated the original offense because she used the heart in some way and thus somebody has to die. Since the heart has nightshade powers because it was a result of Lightlark, which is made by nightshades and sunlings and wildlings, Oro thinks they can kill Grimm and just use the heart's power to deal with whatever vague thing Nightshade is keeping at bay. This makes absolutely no sense. The heart blooms once every 100 years, so why would it be eternal once you hold it? And Oro thinks wielding the heart was the original offense that started the curses. Surely thus abusing the heart's power nonstop would result in new, worse curses. Isla is upset by the notion of killing Grimm and gets Celeste and Grimm in on a plan to use the bond breaker and run away. 
So we're back to square one there, plus Grim. After searching all of the libraries and the side MacGuffin quests, Celeste and Isla decided the Bondbreaker probably didn't exist. But Oro showed her a second secret extra secret library when they were looking for the heart, and she assumes it's there, and she's right. Very bold. She tells Grimm to teleport at night to the old Wildling Palace, believing the fact it nullifies other realms' magic will also nullify other realms' curses. Very bold. If she was wrong, and she's not, she would have exploded her boyfriend. But, you know, Isla isn't wrong about anything, really, is she? Now we enter what I have dubbed Plot Twist Corner. Um, Plot Twist Corner is really like one or two chapters. It's the climax. It is called Plot Twist Corner for a very good reason. And um, in honor of Plot Twist Corner, I'm going to just take a second here to uh, doff my hat because I want to show some respect. So uh, Grimm is so moved by just, I don't know, Isla existing and teleporting him at night, even though she very much risked his dying, that he finally confesses his deep, dark, deep, dark secret. And it is a doozy. Okay, so I wish I had some sort of dramatic way to say twist. Uh, twist. Twist. <laughs> I, I don't know. Twist. Uh, Grimm and Isla used to know each other. In fact, they were deeply in love. All her dreams of them having sex were memories. He used his powers to wipe her memories shortly before the centennial. So the whole time she's met him, fallen in love with him, been horny for him, he's known everything about her intimately. She even thinks that she's a virgin who hasn't been kissed when they've had tons of sex. He has had sex with her under these weird false pretenses. It's insane and very bad, and it's actually going to get worse, so I'll cover it a little bit more in a second. So Isla runs away from Grimm, and she meets Celeste, who has the bond breaker. It works by draining your blood, so Celeste and Isla prick their hands. Suddenly, Isla starts to feel unwell, and Grimm is outside, like they can see him out a window, and he also falls over feeling super unwell. Twist. Uh, Celeste is evil. Twist! The Bond Breaker is actually the Bond Maker, and is letting her steal power from Isla. Six magical droplets representing each of the realms float up from Celeste's, like, spilled blood. But wait, how does Celeste have all six realms' powers if she's stealing from a powerless Isla? Twist! Uh, both Oro and Grimm are in love with Isla, and on Lightlark, that means sharing power. And Isla didn't realize this, but she has access to their power. But wait, how does that explain Celeste also having wildling power? Uh, okay, hold on for that one, because we'll get back to that one. We have a couple more secrets before I can cover the wildling power part. By secrets, I mean twist. Twist! Uh, so Celeste has a secret flair where she's a shapeshifter. And twist! Uh, Celeste is someone named Aurora from 500 years ago who faked her death. You see, 500 years ago, Aura slash Celeste was going to marry Oro's brother. Oro's brother then fell in love with Aurora's best friend, Violet, a wildling. Violet the wildling being Isla's ancestor. Aurora was so angry at Oro's brother for cheating on her with Isla's ancestor that, twist, she seduced Grimm. So yeah, Grimm has had sex with a woman who is enemies with his now girlfriend's great-great-grandmother. It's just always going to be super weird. Aurora got Grimm to find the heart of Lightlark. She'd known of it as like a rare flower, and she had tracked it. But when Grimm found it for her, he unknowingly unlocked its magic powers, as it can only be found and used by a nightshade, wildling, or sunling. Aurora then used it somehow anyways, but because she hadn't found it, she accidentally cursed every kingdom and person except for herself. I don't know, man. Aurora faked her death and vowed to get all of the realm's powers and end the Lightlark royal line. This is, of course, after her cheating boyfriend committed ritual suicide and all, so she really was upset about that called-off wedding, huh? Uh, she spends the next 500 years trying to seduce Oro, eat Centennial, pretending to be a different starling, and find the Bondbreaker. But because of nonsense rules, if she wanted my alarm to go off, if she wanted all six powers, she had to do it in one go from someone who has access to all six powers. Someone like Isla. Okay. Twist. Isla was wrong about her parents. She thought her mother had somehow beaten the wildling curse and not killed her father, but in exchange, the curse had taken revenge and made Isla born powerless. And then, in addition, um, when she was born, her father went crazy and murdered her mother and then himself. And that's not true. Actually, 
Her father was a powerful nightshade top general under Grimm, who used the star stick to meet Isla's mother. Because nightshades have powers relaying to curses, not explained, he was able to suppress her feral wildling love curse long enough to have Isla. <laughs> Because apparently nightshades can suppress other people's curses, which feels very important, but is not explained beyond this, this one thing. This one section really reads like a parlor scene in a detective story where the detective like recounts the entire plot, timeline, everyone's secrets. Uh, it's, uh, I believe it's called like a, God, it's not a denouncement. It's very similar to that. And oh, oh, twist, twist. Uh, she is extremely powerful, Isla. She has always had powers, but having two powers, because she is Nightshade and Wildling at the same time, made them get tangled together and hit each other somehow. This actually, by the way, to just take a brief, brief diversion, is against canon. Uh, there is an explicit scene where Isla asks about kids born to two realms, because on Lightlark, they live together, so intermarriage is a thing. It doesn't appear to be in the other realms. So here's Isla talking. How does inter-realm marriage affect power, then? Children are... They born with just one realm's ability? She looked at him. They don't get both, do they? He shook his head. She waited expectedly, waiting for a better explanation. The king sighed. They are born with one power, wildling. 164. So, yeah, it's against canon. Anyways, Isla is super powerful, and Aurora saw her way to get, like, nightshade and wildling powers, as well as Oro's four powers, all at once. And, twist, she's been working with Grimm. In the year Grimm took Isla's memories, Isla said something suspicious to Grimm about Celeste, and he showed up at Celeste slash Aura's home. Aurora explained she simply wanted to kill her cheating fiancé's family, his brother Oro, and then she'd be ready to die, I guess. She offers Grimm a plan where he'd get Lightlark, break the curses, and only Oro would have to die. Uh, Grimm and uh, Isla are in love, but Aurora told him the original offense that had to be repeated, was a Sunling ruler falling in love with a Wildling ruler. So, twist, he, without asking, he assumed Isla would say no to this plan and non-consensually took away all memories of their relationship so she'd fulfill the plan of getting Oro to fall in love with her. He hears him on the subject. His voice took a desperate edge as she still refused to look him in the eye. It was the most difficult decision I've ever made, heart reader heart eater even, knowing that succeeding meant you beguiling someone else, making you forget our story, our love. She met his gaze. Difficult for you, his voice turned resolute. I was going to give the memories back. Once Oro loved you and you remembered you loved me, we could take all of Lightlark's power and rule together. I did it for my realm, your realm, for us, heart. 333. Grimm is already, like, a really pathetic dude, but this takes the cake. Isla's mentors raised her to seduce the king. Isla and Aurora, as Celeste, plan to run away with the Bondbreaker instead. Isla dated Grimm, and they were in love. I know it seems like we need a chart at this point. Aurora told Grimm that Isla needs to seduce the king. If Grimm just told her this plan, Isla would have just done it. The plan doesn't require Isla loving Oro back, and she's been literally trained her whole life to seduce Oro. Yet Grimm assumes she'd refuse, wipes her memory, which leaves Grimm back at square one, not interested in following her mentor's plans to seduce Oro, and instead focused entirely on running away with Aurora. Then, of course, is the issue that Grimm can't follow his own plan, because he can't keep away from Isla. He's wiped all her memories, but he knows all of her secrets and tastes, and he seduces her, flirts with her, shows off to her, and retakes her virginity, basically. You know... Grim, you took her memory so you could go so she could go seduce Oro and not be distracted by you, and you immediately ruined that day too with a chocolate date. Extremely creepy and extremely weird. Aurora reveals all of this, but we actually still have one more really bad twist in this chapter because this has all been one chapter. And honestly, this twist, for all the other ones being insanely stupid, this one kind of might be the worst of them all. Isla grabs a dagger and jumps to cut Aurora's throat. But twist, the dagger shatters into a bunch of pieces. Be because, um, it didn't make sense. Aurora couldn't wield her abilities here. The Starling ruler laughed. The dagger you chose at the Starling shop, the one I planted there. 
one I had enchanted so it could never kill me should you discover my plot. Of course you chose the one with a serpent on it. So predictable, little bird. So weak. So foolish. 335. Yeah, wild. So Isla owns many weapons. Her room, like in her actual realm, has a literal wall of swords. She is always carrying around shurikens and swords and knives, very much in the plural. But Aurora enchanted a single dagger, knew she would go to a specific shop to buy it, knew Isla would pick it out out of all of the options, and knew Isla would one day use it against her. That's just silly. Isla then takes out her star stick, which has been buzzing and glowing this whole time apparently, from her secret hiding spot of along her spine. Uh, a reoccurring theme in this book, by the way, Isla's apparent spine pocket. She only wears tight skimpy dresses, yet is constantly hiding and smuggling weapons in her star stick. At one point, smuggling two swords down the back of her corseted tight dress. Isla teleports away to the Wildling Lands. She runs into her tutor and twist. They have also been working for Aurora, lying to her and hiding the fact she has powers. They were forced to and twist. They killed her parents too, so she could be raised to seduce Oro more effectively. Okay. Isla grabs some weapons and armor and returns fighting Aurora with her amazing, powerful skills. And yes, twist. Isla has figured out somehow that the original offense wasn't using the heart of, like, the heart of Larklight or a sunling falling in love with a wildling. It was actually Aurora killing Violet, and Isla's ancestor. Specifically the act of killing a best friend in cold blood. This, like a lot of twists, makes no sense. If, um, if you can even remember the timeline way back when, the curses are cast, the rulers go to consult an oracle, and the ruler, like, the oracle gets them all to kill themselves for the prophecy. Violet is actually said to be the first to have committed suicide for the prophecy, which is a little strange because I imagine they were all, like, in a circle doing this properly, but whatever. Both Grimm and Oro were alive and on the island when this happened, um, among many other people. If Violet had been murdered, how did that get lost in history? How did no one notice? She died before the curses happened and no one looked for her? How did no one over the years think, hey, Violet, being violently, mysteriously murdered right as the curses hit, might be related to the curses? Might even be that original offense we have to know about. So Isla is suddenly beat by, like, Aurora, but also then suddenly, twist, she figures out that having used the heart to heal herself after, like, getting shot has marked her somehow. She summons the heart from across the island into her hand. It just, like, flies out of a window and zooms through the air, and in seconds she's holding it. And she uses the power to kill Aurora, first taking the Bond Maker to take back all of the power Aurora stole. The island opens up, and Aurora's body falls into a chasm. Isla also falls into the chasm, but she's saved by somebody using Wildling power. But she doesn't have Wildling power. Someone she... Wait, wait, loves? Is doing this? Using her powers? Twist! It's Oro! And also, twist, Grim tries, but he can't use her power because she doesn't love him anymore. Okay, so that is the, um, that's the climax, and now we basically just hit the wrap-up. There's, like, two chapters left after that point. I feel the need to say that, uh, my head feels delirious right now from talking so much, and, um, I have a heart rate watch for medical reasons, and my pulse is about 130 for uh, God knows why. This is what Light Lark does to you. This is what Light Lark does to a man. <laughs> so, wrap up. There are about 10 days to spare, proving that even with the constant time skips, the author still couldn't fill 100 days. The curses are all broken. We hear of Cleo and Azul in, like, the epilogue. Cleo is off being suspicious, evil, mean, and Azul is still providing nothing to the universe. Grimm is gone, and Vine messages her that she'll return to him once her memories return. Oro and Isla both seem confused that they're now in love. Uh, by using the Bond Maker on Aurora, Isla stole her Starling ruler power, so now she is the ruler of Starling. So the Starlings aren't all dead, and she's even more overpowered. Uh, at the very end, Oro and Isla go to a MacGuffin locked door and unlock it at the end of the book, not telling us what's inside. I haven't mentioned the magic secret swirl door or whatever, because it doesn't matter. And honestly, there's not much I can tell you about it. I mean, the book literally ends with them opening this door and not telling us what's behind it. It's just a MacGuffin dumb door like everything else. 
And yes, the secret key that she could never find for more than half the book was in fact the crown she is constantly wearing on her head. So that's Lightlark. Yeah. Six figures, huh? Yeah. But I'm not done with this review because that is only the plot summary and I still have to go over much more in depth the world building, the characters, the prophecy itself, um, Isla especially, talking about characters. So unfortunately, that's the plot summary and dear God, I got a lot more stuff. Lightlark, huh? <laughs> I need to be a bit closer. Uh, okay, Lightlark, huh? Okay, so where do we even start with Lightlark? Just looking at it, thinking about it, wondering about it. Uh, well, let's start with the world building, okay? Um, here's an example of some of the world building. Let me read you the quote. A king far before me, this is Oro speaking, I should say that. A king far before me trapped them in ice so they would never leave or die. Three women born with the gift of prophecy. Enraged at being imprisoned, two of them joined forces of Nightshade, calling to the dark part of the island. When Night Isle was destroyed, they froze forever. 2.36. Yeah, um, world building is one of the key facets of fiction, uh, especially speculative fiction. It's actually in all fiction at all. Like, even if you're writing contemporary, world building still matters. World building... I mean, it's the notion, you know, that for a story to exist, you should also think about the world and how the world is affected by the story, how the world shapes the story. Even a contemporary story set in, like, a university, the university is a setting, and you should build that setting, and thus the world of this university and the plot and all that, with kind of similar things. It's only that with fantasy and sci-fi, and speculative fiction as it's called, usually you're doing it with um, a lot more things that are in our day-to-day -day life aren't familiar with, so you need to be able to introduce and explain them well. Whereas if you're writing a contemporary thing, people generally know what most things in the world are. So yeah, world building, it's the notion that to tell a good story about unreal events in unreal places, a writer needs to plan their setting deliberately. There's a lot of different methods from this, from fantasy authors who make multiple constructed languages and think about like crop yields, to simply deciding a couple key facts about life outside of the plot, like what was happening five years before the plot started in a different location than the plot. World building isn't a dull form-based homework assignment. It's an exciting chance to think about what your fictional reality is like, how systems interact, invent magic and monsters, um, plan out how your character and plot interact with each other. How was your character shaped by the plot? How does the plot shape your character? That's true, but the setting goes in there too, and now it's like, how does the setting, you know, interact with the plot and the character? How did it shape those? And vice versa. There's a lot of really cool stuff. I, I, world building to me is perhaps the most important factor in fiction. I do definitely say that for me because I know some people have different opinions on it, and that's cool. But I love world building. I love a book with a cool world, and I love even books that aren't very good that have cool worlds. I'm just interested in ideas and like new places and new things and how that would work out. I'm always really into like the minute details and the small little spice things that like just make the world seem much more alive and real and plausible and cool. There's so many ways to do world building right and do it weird even. Uh, it just needs to feel internally consistent and in some fantastic way plausible. Genre fiction like fantasy, especially high fantasy, is still a chance to get like wet and wild with ideas. You can have a ton of fun. And Lightlark has ideas, don't get me wrong, but it just lacks the skill to deliver those. I've pointed out at this point a lot how a lot of the structure and plot feel improvised and not revised. They just sort of stick out and jut in these awkward ways. The heart is introduced about halfway through the story as a goal a vague magic object that spawns for unclear reasons attached to a living thing for unknown reasons, which can maybe apparently be wielded in some way for some purpose only by specific people, maybe. The island is inhabited by ancient creatures, a catch-all for ghosts, mermaids, and winged blue people. They're sentient monsters, I guess. They're entirely unexplored as a concept. They're not people, they're creatures, but they are sentient. 
All of them appear for one scene only and then fade into non-existence. The island itself is as poorly defined a setting, you know, it's rather infamously the first description of Lightlark we ever get is Lightlark was a shining, cliffy thing. That's page 16. It's not even just the writing of saying thing, it's a cliffy thing. It was a shining, cliffy island, I would assume, but apparently it was just a thing. And beyond that, because I've read this so many times, it's basically ingrained in my memory. Uh, this is the first paragraph we ever get a description, and it does go on a little bit more, but it only goes on for one sentence more. And that sentence is, uh, it had, its bluffs were um, white as bone, and sunlight like fell upon it in like a golden mist. And that's nothing. The only thing I could picture was basically like the white cliffs of Dover, because it's a cliffy and white. The climate is, I believe, temperate. Beyond that, it's hard to say what Lightlark is as a place. It's also magical too, so Moon Isle is Arctic, so maybe all the isles are different, maybe they're not. Like, the first idea we have of Lightlark, the location, is quite specific, it paints a clear picture, and then it's immediately so horrendously refuted it's distracting throughout, okay? Lightlark is the island the Centennial is held on. It's trapped under a cursed storm for 99 years and 260 days, 265 days at a time. The curses that spread caused everyone to flee from the island and found new islands. Everyone but Oro is trapped, and like the Sunlings and some other people who decide to stay. And even then, we're told the only reason they probably stayed is because like being near Lightlark means you live longer because it's so magical. It, it's very vague. It's a one-off thing. Except, okay, um, this is what we know about it. Cursed island. Everyone fled because it was so cursed and horrible. Uh, so wait, 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 wait. Let me let me read you what we see when we first see life on Lightlark, because there are people here, surprisingly. The Agora was made up of tiny houses, all pushed together and different as each of the realms. One shop resembled a turned-over teacup, its walls made of frosted glass. Another stood tall as a redwood, smoke spilling from a chimney like a string of storm clouds. The next was held up on stilts. Yet another resembled a star roped down from the heavens, silver and gleaming, Page 37. Lightlark, the cursed island trapped in an eternal storm which everyone fled from, is lovely. It has chocolate shops, dress designers, art stores, many merry pubs, there's even a brothel. The storm can't be too bad because the buildings are these fairy tale storybook homes all charming and cute, not worried about uncertain horrible weather. It's the only place where people of the realms intermingle regularly and work together happily. People are making cotton candy and selling ice cream. It's extremely quaint. Like, look at what happens at night. And seriously, if you could tell me what happens at night, I'd love to know. Somehow, I love it when it says somehow, somehow some of the stores had been turned inside out, their walls completely folding into the streets. No doors to be seen, the ceiling stretched out and wide like a fan. Patrons walked freely inside pubs and moments later out, holding foaming, overflowing drinks. That's page 46. By opening up, I kind of assume it's like a dollhouse situation. Very wild. Yeah, this description of the downtown marketplace is entirely and utterly at odds with the book and the tone of the world. The world feels very like aesthetic fantasy, like it's a focus on pretty dresses, swords, magic, crowns. Then there's kind of like the code of superficial anachronistic luxury that's typical in like a light YA fantasy, you know? It's not the kind of book where we'll have to worry about periods or chamber pots or like disease. Uh, topping it up, you know, we have some dark fantasy elements. There's wars and murder and evil spooky darkness and, you know, ooh, murdering each other in a spooky game of evil, you know? But the marketplace is a storybook fairy tale land. It's far more magical and whimsical than you'd expect a teen, like a book keen on being a sexy Hunger Games would involve. Yeah, the, the market isn't the only place where this sort of different tone shows up. The floating heart that's secretly an egg definitely fits, as are these random details in between, like whispering cemetery trees and like a talking wind that shares gossip and secrets. The storm of trapped souls. I mean, I guess that's a bit dark fantasy, but none of these details are really like, no detail ever, is really expanded upon, like, puzzle pieces in this incoherent mythology of magic and lore. Most tidbits are one-off references. There's nothing wrong with any of this, even the jarring tone. If 
in any way Lightlark was interested in it. Rather, every piece of added world building feels like the author is just dumping like five loose puzzle pieces in a stack, not trying to fit them together. And she keeps doing this every single second. And it's overwhelming you before you can even like notice that every single piece doesn't even come from the same set and you can't put them together. The, the marketplace definitely was one of those early signs where I was like, this is exceptionally a problem. <laughs> It's, it's so, it's so unclear. I mean, why is it an Agora? Let's just ask that for a second here. Well, I have the time, I have the space. An Agora is a really specific term. The Agora, an Agora is a term from ancient Greece. It is a sort of marketplace town center thing in ancient Greece. The book does not have a dedication to an ancient Greek aesthetic in particular, and the described place certainly isn't an Agora. So why use that word? So the most typical way that you see people sit and like expand on their fantasy world is to treat it a bit like a checklist. Like, what's the government? What do people wear? What sort of festivals do they have? What's their religion? This is, a, you know, like you can call it simplistic, um, but it is useful. It often gets you thinking about your story. It gets you thinking about your world. And, you know, even if the details never come in in whatever piece you're creating, knowing these things can then really, I mean, it helps you build the world. It's called world building. So Lightlark really exemplifies its failed world building in this extremely obvious way with the Abbey. Early in the book, Isla notes an Abbey with a single stained glass eye. This is already pretty odd because she can recognize an Abbey, a religious building, but she notes the eye like it's an unusual detail. She doesn't say, you know, there's an Abbey with the, you know, crest of the all god or whatever. She, she says, you know, it has a window of a single stained glass eye, like that is in a notable detail. The Abbey is this passing minor thing, but it's one I just kept on mind because I kept thinking, what, what? We have a couple times where like the word worship or prayer is used and I'm just thinking like, what could this be? Well, there's an Abbey, there must be religion. So about 150 pages later, we get chapter 29, the Abbey. And oh my gosh, I thought I was so, I was like, I'm finally going to learn about this world's religion. I got maybe excited for a moment. Like, I wonder what they're going to have. And you know what? You know what, folks? Folks, I did not learn about this world's religion. The chapter set in the Abbey does not refer to or explain the Abbey in any way. Rather, Isla and Grimm get caught in the rain and take shelter, uh, being exceptionally hot for each other in their sheer clinging clothes. The most lore we get is that there are pews because Grimm, like, I don't know, sits on a pew for a second presumably worship. And again, there is a single window, the single window of a single stained glass eye. Let me read you a sentence that I think really helps some so much up in this book. Suddenly, the stained glass window seemed very interesting. Isla studied its four illustrations intently. It's 190. So there's one window. We know that there's one window. We know that the one window has a single stained glass eye on it. And here, Isla studies the window and its four illustrations. Is it an eye over four illustrations? Or is it an eye or is it illustrations? I don't know. The fact that it is four illustrations, already a bit odd. We have six realms. They all kind of fall into, maybe they worship the elements they get their powers from, but there's six of them and there's only four here. And we do hear that she's studying these four stained glass pictures and well, we were never told what those pictures are of. It's not like, you know, oh, the, the leaf, the sun, the what. No, no. Four illustrations intently. Moving on. The Abbey. It's done. Never think about it again. Never address it again. See, it's all surface level aesthetics in Lightlark. The book is definitely built on a Pinterest board. It feels like stolen photographs building a thinly defined world. There are countless small details to talk about, like in the very first paragraph of the book. We have a throwaway mention of rare perfumes on Isla's bedroom vanity. Is it really needless nitpicking to think about that for one second? Please, indulge me. Isla is a wildling on the Wildling Newlands, a place of nature where everybody can grow plants in seconds and embraces nature. They run around naked or wearing leaves, they adventure with animal companions. Rare perfumes, though, implies two things. One, wildlings, who are druid hippie plant people, have a want for perfume. They want to smell like flowers, despite being able to bloom flowers in a second and wear living flowers even. They find the notion of putting on a purposeful scent over your natural one appealing in some way. 
and Isla's tutors, who do not let her leave her room, have got her several. Two, perfume has enough quantity and demand that some are capable of being defined as rare, which also implies that the one with nature people have some interest in capitalism and scarcity. That, or the plants used for them are rare, again telling us the wildlings are so into perfume, they would harvest very rare plants to make perfume rather than preserve them. See, that sentence one, literally sentence one, and there's a throwaway mention that completely draws into question this world. I'm not actually, believe it or not, anal about fidelity in a fantasy setting. My favorite book series is the Mortal Engines Quartet. It's extremely good and everyone should read it. And the Mortal Engines Quartet is based on very loose ideas of like, what if everyone, thousands of years in the future, put treads on cities and big jaws and they ran around and ate each other? And also ideas like, what if a robot zombie dad made you cry deeply for forever? You know, these are not ideas that if you work out the science, it doesn't really work, you know? It's, if you work out the logic, eh, eh. it's a good book though. You know, my last read, last book I read was uh, Black Witch Chronicles 4, The Demon Tide. Uh, that book had magic sewing machines and like string lights and flying ships with magic. And, you know, what bothers me about Lightlark though, you know, is that it's not a good book. So I can't focus on the good parts and wave away the world building. I can't suspend my disbelief because I'm having such a fun time, you know, reading about these moving cities. I just kind of am left with nothing to think about but the world building. And it doesn't even seem to know what it wants to be either. Like, Lightlark is almost shy to define itself beyond its reliance on aesthetics and tropes. There's so many points of unexplained lore and things that just don't make any logical sense. Some of them are bigger offensive than other, but pretty much all of them, it would be good to know, and it raises the question, but it's not explained. Let me just go through a really long list. Isla lives in an ancient greenhouse. Ancient? How ancient can it be if it is 500 years old and most people live for hundreds of years? Why would wildlings, who can grow any plant, need greenhouses in the first place? Why would they have one and then abandon it in the course of 500 years? How are relics and enchantments made? How do they work? How come the rulers teleport to Lightlark for the centennial, having constructed special portals on their new lands, but don't use this magic anywhere else. Before making Lightlark, where did the Six Realms even live? If the Isle of Lightlark is so livable, why did everyone flee? Why are Lightlark citizens so loyal to their rulers but remain on Lightlark? If Isla had powers the whole time, but no wildling curse because her secret nightshade powers were suppressing it, how come she didn't have the nightling curse? Since, you know, nightshade power curse powers can't stop their own curse, presumably. Why did every single wildling flee Lightlark when other nations had people who decide to stay? The wildlings are then abandoning all their favorite trees in nature. Why is history so poorly recorded if ghosts exist and wildlings literally turn into talking memory trees? Why do wildlings not know they helped create Lightlark, and honestly, does that even matter? What is an origin? Why is Aura one, but no one else is? Lightlark was created by the ancestors of Oro, Isla, and Grimm, yet Oro's family became known as the only creators, and Oro is so tied to the island he cannot leave. Why were Grimm and Isla's ancestors or families not also trapped? Oro has the powers of all citizens of Lightlark, but how long do you need to be on the island before Oro gains your abilities? How come Oro is the last origin, and how come the other origins then weren't rulers, apparently? Why were there three seers born, and how did the ritual suicide actually generate a prophecy? Was the oracle just fucking with them as revenge for the eternal ice punishment? How much power does the average person have? How much more powerful are they than, like, you know, as a ruler then? Why is everyone, after thousands of years living together, still deeply segregated by realm? There's just so much, honestly, and I bet I'm missing some, even... The first time I finished this review, uh, the writing version of it, my flatmate, who's listened to me talk about this book extensively, she raised a couple points and I had to go in and add them in. And there's still things I'm not even bringing up because there's just so much lore and so much of it, I mean, none of it, let's be real, makes sense. <laughs> so the few times that Lightlark kind of teases at the idea that it might have depth, it winds up completely stumbling. So let's go into something real quickly, real quickly, that I hate. 
the economy. Okay, look, I, I don't care about the economy in my escapist fiction. When it's deeply accurate research, logical, it's kind of just boring to me, and when it's careless and incorrect, it's frustrating and stands out really a lot. Lightlark only mentions the economy kind of twice, and doesn't really do anything sensical with it. So the Moonling's curse is that every full moon, the ocean tries to kill them. Uh, we get this sentence, though. It made faraway trade nearly impossible and had completely crippled the Moonling's economy. It's from page 27. We have no grasp of wild, like Lightlark's size or world map, but as the Moonlings were able to flee when the curse is hit and found a new island, we know that they live a maximum of 30 days sailing away. We can assume that the other new lands are probably similar. We have the term nearly impossible to look at. It made faraway trade nearly impossible. Moonlings can't be at sea during a full moon because of the curse, yeah, but how would that in any way cripple the economy? <laughs> Work on your scheduling. When it's a full moon, just stop on an island and go inland for a bit. I mean, economy saved. There you go. Our other introduction to the idea of value in this fantasy land is gems and gold. So Isla arrives on the island wearing a bunch of rings with gems the size of acorns and gifts one to Azul, who is deeply impressed. He wears the ring for the rest of the book because he's that big on this one diamond. Isla, though, notes gems are meaningless on the wildling lands. Jewels were made when great power was wielded over nature, and over the centuries the glittering gems had bloomed beneath the ground in the wildling new land, rising up eventually, blossoming like flowers. It was difficult not to trip over some sort of precious stone in Isla's lands. Her tutor had always said those glittering rocks were the reason they had such a steady supply of hearts. Thieves from other realms, foolish and bold and wicked, sneaked onto their territory for the diamonds. Pages 14 to 15. Okay, so interesting. Uh, gems are a byproduct of wildling magic, and they're valuable to thieves, and coveted even by the Skyling King. But w one second, w what's this? A while later? Thousands of years ago, it was said starlings could make diamonds. Wildlings could make emeralds and rubies grow in their palm like flowers. Sunlings could turn goblets to gold. It represented a complete mastery of power. It's from page 70. Okay, okay, so gems used to deliberately be made by everyone back when magic was stronger back in the day. Isla thinks nothing of gems, um, her people are literally tripping over them, but Azul is enchanted by them. Uh, sunlings can't create gold, but they can gild with it, maybe. It just doesn't add up. I mean, consider a fact. Thousands of years ago, magic was just stronger, and everyone could create gems if they were skilled at magic. Gems were also a byproduct of strong magic, so creating gems above ground was also generating gems below ground. Consider something else. All the realms lived on the same island for thousands of years, and they're not destroying the gems in any way. The world of Lightlark should be saturated with gems. Diamonds are famously unbreakable. I mean, they're not going to be disappearing that much. I mean, gems could be a cool status symbol, like, I'm extra good at magic, I could make a ruby. But in this universe, they're a byproduct of thousands of years of magic. Why would they have any value beyond, say, like, I guess, quartz? And even then, they sound more common than that. Why would thieves do the however long journey to visit the Wildering Realms just for gems? And I mean, speaking of those thieves, uh, hearts and powers and curses, they don't really align with each other, and they definitely don't align with magic. With logic, even. Gosh, magical logic. This is frying my brain. It's been 500 years since the curses began. Rulers are quasi-immortal, and some of, like, very powerful magic people also seem to live for th hundreds of years. So, you know, it seems maybe, though, that normal people have a regular lifespan, probably. Like, we don't know. I mean, especially the starlings who all die at 25. And that brings us to a really interesting aspect of world building, which Lightlark does not engage in. Culture. A generation is about 20 years, so the realms have gone through about 25 generations. In that time, society should have shifted to reflect the curses significantly. This is actually a rather interesting challenge to me. Like, spending many, many, many hours of my life talking through this book with friends has made me kind of like the concept of a bunch of cursed kingdoms and how they'd adapt, and it's sort of like a fun world-building puzzle. Starlings, for example, you know, die at 25, and there's kind of a lot you could do. I read a really kind of pretty bad YA book uh, that had a pretty similar premise, which is called Wither. Uh, that YA book also got a lot of stuff wrong, but it also clearly thought more about it than this book did. And that was a dystopia from like 2012. 
like how would the world change if everyone suddenly got cursed? It's it's interesting to think about, and let's let's just talk a little bit more in depth about realms, curses, powers, and how Lightlark doesn't actually engage with them. Okay, so curses and powers. Let's let's start this in um an order of least difficult to most difficult. It's pretty obvious who number one is, right? Skylings have air power, and now they can't fly. Let's look again at the constant tagline of this book, each curse uniquely wicked. Yeah, they're now just normal humans, but with sick wind powers. When the curse struck, I'm sure a lot of them fell out of the air and died, though. Like, you know, that sucks, but you're fine. I mean, their home island also has, like, a floating city on it, but they've literally just attached some bridges and, like, ladders post-curse, and they're fine. Nothing more to say on the Skylings. Moonling's Curse. Uh, yeah, Moonling's Curse is the whole ocean full moon murder thing. This is extremely avoidable. Just don't go near the ocean on a full moon. We even witness a full moon on Moon Isle in the palace, and everyone just goes indoors and waits it out. Moon Isle probably isn't too big, but their new land realm likely must be. Like, you'd found, like, you'd find a really big island so that you guys could avoid the ocean. Yet the book has this very funny line. Every full moon, the sea claim dozens of lives from their realm, drowning anyone who finds themselves too close to the coast. It's page 27. Dozens. It, it drowns dozens. We have no grasp of population anywhere. Lightlark, though, is thousands of citizens. Dozens of people, every full moon, are killed by the moon. Like, mo moonlings, moonlings, moonlings. I'm begging you, stop going near the coast on murder moon night. It's been 500 years. A society where once a month the ocean tries to kill you would likely train everyone on moon cycles. You'd have clocks and charts. You'd, I don't know, every morning you'd just be like, hey, it's a uh, waxing whatever today. You, you, would, you would remind everybody every full moon during the day, like, hey, it's full moon night. Don't go near the goddamn ocean. It's been 500 years. Okay. Uh, sunlings and nightshades have mirror curses. No sun, uh, no night. These are extremely easy to deal with. Don't go outside. You're completely fine if you stay inside reading a book or sleeping or whatever. You don't even need to really be limited by the no day or no night rule, as you can just sort of restructure civil commercial services to just be underground or interior. Build connecting tunnels and tubes. We, we don't see Nightshade's home island, but Lightlark definitely does not have any sort of this sort of thing. Like there's some covered windows. I think they painted over glass a couple times. But it's actually really quite a livable curse. The starlings, the starlings have it rough. Um, we have to imagine, like, when the curses hit, there was mass death, like, all around. Skylings fell, sunlings burned to death, wildlings went berserk. But the starlings definitely had the roughest day one. Everyone over the age of 25 just suddenly died. This is a fairly crippling curse, kinda. Lightlark portrays it as definitely so, with Isla visiting Star Isle and seeing it in ruins. She notes that everyone dying at 25 means they barely have a government. It's just like some, uh, she calls them uh, good nobles in charge who are barely children when they die, basically. Uh, which is really funny because she does in fact say that these nobles who are running the country are barely children at 25, and she is in fact... 19, which implies she is a child. Okay. <laughs> yeah, look, it'd be really rough to have the population all die young, but it's not really so bad it would crumble. It would take a lot of adaption, but it is entirely possible and they've had 500 years. So like the age of everything would shift down. People would be expected to have kids, full stop, but also people would be expected to have kids earlier and it become the norm. Uh, work apprenticing would probably start before you're even a teen, like at like 10 or something. Uh, a lot of mathematics would be involved to ensure important roles are always filled. Uh, but yeah, no, you you know, you just make sure everyone's always apprenticing, you know, all the important roles have somebody to take over and then somebody to take over them. You just stack it up like that and, you know, it's not actually that bad. It wouldn't dissolve into absolute ruins, which is what we see. Not to sound like overconfident, but people in their 20s aren't entirely useless children either. Like a 23-year-old is an adult. You, they, they, could, they could manage this government okay. It shouldn't be literally crumbling to bits. Especially after 500 years of societal adaption. And that brings us to wildlings. Wildlings have 
two curses. Eating hearts, human hearts, and killing their loved ones. I, I have a theory on why they have two curses. Uh, Aurora perhaps wielded the heart to only curse wildlings or only curse Violet. She messed up and accidentally cursed everyone else. Additionally, which gave then the wildlings two curses. But that's not canon. Doesn't make the most sense. It's just the best I got. Let's just talk about the easier of the two curses, which is murdering each other. <laughs> wildlings are apparently a rapidly depleting population because of this curse, despite love being forbidden. The curse is specifically that when a wildling falls in love, they must then kill the person they fall in love with. It's uh, somehow like unclear, but I believe it's only women, as the word is like temptresses is used a lot, seductresses. Uh, they say that mostly women are born and that's a problem, so only women go feral to kill. Uh, and when they go feral, I say feral, it doesn't use the word, it just says that they must kill. But the implication is that they don't have any control of themselves and just must go kill. So the population, you know, being only women is not actually a bad thing. I mean, famously, uh, men can impregnate multiple women, while women can only be pregnant one at a time. So your population isn't necessarily completely doomed by having a higher percentage of women. Okay, and you know, really just change it to be like a, you know, bad dystopia. Like 2012 era. The culture should just be about casual sex, emotional coldness, change the folklore and the social concept of love, uh, you know, limit relationships that are likely to become romantic, set up a reproductive pairing system uh, that just basically rewards people and encourages them to have a child in an anonymous way and then move on, focus on family units and the kind of it takes a village mindset. Um, there's a lot you can do about this that obviously just hasn't taken place. Especially when we think about the idea of love. So I'm not saying that you can, like, love is entirely a social construct or anything. I don't know, man. But we definitely live in a society now. We live in a society. We live in a society right now that's very, um, there's a technical term for it, which is like a matonormative, a normative, something like that. But basically we live in a society where the norm for us as people is that we will all pair off typically heterosexually, get married, have kids, continue the cycle. That is the societal norm and romantic relationships are something that is portrayed in all media all of the time, extremely common, completely normal. Um, and you know, on one hand, you know, it probably like does reflect, I don't know that if you live in a society which had no concept of romance, the idea, but was capable of romance, romance wouldn't still happen. I don't know. It's a very complicated idea between nature and nurture. I don't know. I'm not some expert on this. What I am saying is that we live in a society that really encourages the idea of romance and pairing up and that sort of thing. If you had a society like the Wildlings, where you need to make sure nobody's falling in love, you might cut off all stories about that sort of thing. You would change all mythology and stories and everything to reflect the idea that love is really, really bad, actually particularly for women. It's, again, kind of dystopian, but it's apparently the only way they're going to su survive. And I, again, can't say confidently, but I'm pretty sure that if you had a society where love was put down as both an evil thing and also entirely unimportant, it's all about your family, your village, and you have children, but having children is a duty or a choice, but it has nothing to do with the other person who helps conceive the child. If you had a society framed that way, who's to say that, like, the rate of people falling in love wouldn't be affected? And I kind of think it would. Yeah, um, you know, it, Wildling Society also kind of poses this cringe-inducing idea where, of, like, the ideal structure. Because men don't go feral, so it should be a patriarchal society for its own good. Since wildling men are stable and wildling women are liable to go crazy over their emotions. In fact, the ideal leader for wildling society, by and far, is gay men. <laughs> if they're way less li they won't go feral, their partners won't go feral, they can have completely normal average relationships without any worry about that sort of thing, and the only problem would be if any women fall in love with them and, generally speaking, heterosexual or women who are interested in men are way less likely to be interested in a gay man romantically because usually when you say somebody's completely closed off a lot of that interest fades so gay men should rule the wildling realms 
but no, there's one more problem, of course, um, and this is the different one. This is the wildling and hearts problem. Wildlings and hearts, human hearts. They are said to exclusively, on page 10, eat human hearts, but we don't actually know if that's true. If a wildling eats something that isn't a heart, do they get sick? Does it turn into ash in their mouth? Does it lack nutrition? Can they eat like completely normal, but they just magically die if they avoid eating human hearts? Isla doesn't think twice about telling Grimm how much she loves chocolate but she is pretending the whole centennial to be eating human hearts in secret. You know, she's given them weekly and she has to pretend. She gets a maid to secretly sneak her normal food. She tells the maid that this is an indulgence between hearts. But obviously she's lying and we don't know if it is normal. Do wildlings only exclusively eat hearts like it says? Can they eat other foods? Do they eat other foods? We don't know and the book doesn't answer that in any way. We know wildlings have wine, though, which is odd, because how does one divide between food and drink strictly? If you eat grapes, do they turn into dust in your mouth, but if you drink wine, you're completely fine? <laughs> no idea. And then you get to the math, and okay, I'm not a mathematician, I don't like math, and look, yeah, okay, it's very, it could be pedantic, I guess, uh, to really look at math in this sort of fantasy setting, but it's when it stands out so badly. It's when I read this thing and it says, wildlings have to eat human hearts and they exclusively eat human hearts. And my first thought was, geez, geez, geez. Uh, if you eat a human heart every single day, each human heart comes from a person and people are really hard to farm, guys. You can't really farm people effectively because each person needs to kill X amount of people. We, we learn quite late in the book, it's one to two hearts a month. If it's daily, then it's like each person every year has to kill 365 people, which is insane. If it's monthly, it's 12 people a year. That's still 12 people a year. And the population math just makes no sense and doesn't add up. So I did decide to tell you a bit of some fun numbers. <laughs> okay. Wildlings eat one or sometimes two hearts a month. Let's just assume the one. That's 12 a year per minimum, like minimum per like 5,000 wildlings, let's say, is 60,000 human hearts a year. In 500 years, that is 30 million human hearts, which of course means 30 million dead people. It's beyond unsustainable and flawed in any scenario you run. The only explanation we get as to how wildlings haven't all starved is that jewel thieves occasionally come there. The best answer my flatmate could come up with was that the wildlings would need to import all the dead bodies from all of the kingdoms. Assuming every single dead body goes to feed the wildlings, we can work out the needed realm population to sustain 5,000 wildlings. About 0.84% uh, of the world's population dies per year. Now that is the modern world. Death rates were higher in the old times, but as they have access to magic healing and elix elixirs, and this doesn't seem to be that grim dark of a world, Let's just round, like, say that that is equivalent, and then let's round it to 1%, which is being a bit generous again for the wildling's sake. To get 60,000 dead people, you would need a population of 6 million people. But we only have 5,000 wildlings, remember. <laughs> if the other realms were then evenly divided, they would each have 1.199 million people in them, compared to the 5,000 wildlings. Wildlings would be 0.0008% of the realm population? And not world, because there's realms beyond this area, maybe. And of course, with all of this, we're ignoring the fact that they sometimes eat two hearts per month. Who knows how they can afford to do that. Uh, and that would multiply all of those insane numbers by like 1.5 on average. And now add in the fact that they all used to live on Lightlark, an island small enough you can walk anywhere in a day. <laughs> Just doesn't seem right in it. Cool aesthetic, though. Um, absolute failure of thought in every single way. Hello there. Uh, well, the uh, march of time and the march of everything else in the world continues, and I'm returning here on day three of me recording this review, which is not what I intended at all. I mean, I always knew it was going to be very long, but I was like, oh, I can do this in a day. And a uh, funny thing happened yesterday. I have medical problems, and the medical problems made me lose the entire day. So here I am, day three of this endless task of 
trying to tell you about Light Lark. So, chocolate. This is about the chocolate scene in Light Lark. I kind of decided very early on I would make a whole section and it was just going to be about the chocolate scene because I think it encapsulates so much wrong with Light Lark, especially like the lack of thought and consistency that's present in every layer of the story. So I mentioned before Isla uh, pretending to only eat hearts because she's pretending to not be not cursed. Uh, she immediately tells the stranger, Grim, that she loves chocolate and they go on a chocolate date and it's day two, you know, cover this. So this is where we see like that uh, Agora, the marketplace, it's all fairy tale buildings. It's the first kind of respite from this really like dramatic mood that they set up where it's like, you know, blood oaths and like the centennial is a deadly game. It's our first rest from all of that very early on. And it's this chocolate date. And it's also sort of like the, the first respite from, you know, set up and all the drama. It's also like our first extremely big red flag. Like I'd say that pretty much from the first paragraph of the book, I was like, oh, okay. But definitely the chocolate scene is where I was like, oh, 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 okay, okay. <laughs> so chocolate, chocolate, oh, lovely, lovely thing, chocolate. I had to spend like um, about a year and a half not being allowed to eat chocolate recently for medical reasons and uh, getting back on that. Oh, good stuff, man. So Isla talks about her love for it in this very like, I want to say like 2015 department store uh, comedy mug way, like what you'd see at like Target or um, Walmart kind of mugs, you know, Primark. Uh, this girl, you know, it's like she's wearing a t-shirt that says like Nutella and Netflix and chill. And she sips from like her mug that says well-behaved women rarely make history. And she's sitting there on her couch and on, on, she has like a wooden sign she bought from Michael's that says all you need is chocolate. Like that is the energy Isla really delivers. Um, here's a quote. The moment Isla walked inside, she groaned from somewhere deep in her chest. Chocolate. Velvety, nutty, sugary chocolate. Actually, Silky was in there too. I just slightly misread it. That is page 37. And uh, then there's this thing here where Grimm goes to feed her some chocolate and she basically, um, she just sort of climaxes, I'm going to describe it as. Uh, so, he picked a truffle between two enormous fingers. Try this one first. She tentatively took it, chewed it, and her eyes bulged. Divine, isn't it? Isla sank into her chair, her head lolling back. She closed her eyes, caramel on her tongue. Wake me up when all of this is over. That's page 38 to 39. Um, so we specifically see that this chocolate shop sells fudge, mint thins, banana butter bars, chili pepper powder pralines, caramel, and chocolate truffles. Uh, look, do I care about chocolate as a really kind of a pretty recent luxury food being in fantasy? And not really. But yeah, I do care about this because to me it's about a lot more than just chocolate. Like chocolate, uh, the plain stuff is made from cocoa and sugar. Um, they both grow in tropical, subtropical, really hot climates. Light Lark is a temperate to cold climate. Uh, bananas and chilies grow in hot to tropical climates. Light Lark is in a 99-year constant storm that apparently never sees the sun, except for 100 days in that period. Chocolate truffles, fudge, mint thins, uh, those things are all basically from the late 1800s to like 1950 in invention. Um, I can't find much on the history of like banana butter bars or chili pralines. But like this isn't just like mild anachronism or um, anacra climateism. It's a long series of them. It's a cheerily modern artesian chocolate shop in the middle of a supposedly cursed storm. You know, on this island, on day two of an allegedly deadly, intense game. And Isla is having an orgasm for being fed chocolate by a stranger she doesn't trust. And next door, all of the shops are shaped like whimsical baubles. This was a scene that really set me off. Um... When I first really started reading the book, uh, my flatmate was at the gym, and when she got back, I was like, hey, uh, I need to tell you about the book I'm reading, which I pretty often do. And I said, hey, let me tell you specifically. I was like, let me tell you about this Agora scene and this chocolate, okay? And then it was six hours later. It was, again, like 12.30 in the morning, I want to say. Um, and I was just getting to the chocolate. I was, I would, 
repeatedly be trying to sum up the world building and I would say, okay, so yeah, the marketplace. Okay, but first let me explain like everything else. And it took me, it was like the next day that I fully could tackle the full subject of the chocolate. That is how much this very small specific aside just really threw me off and just, again, I'm not an angry person, but I just found myself so frustrated because of the lack of care that the author put in and the editors put in to thinking about the world in this book. The prophecy. Uh, the prophecy needs its own section, and the prophecy section is probably one of the most important sections to cover because the prophecy is the plot of this book, and... It's the setup of this book. It's everything about this book is the curses. The curses are directly tied to this prophecy. The prophecy is pretty much everything. And the prophecy is very, very bad. Uh, I'm going to read the prophecy again to remind you because um, we might be like, I don't know how long it's been, like six hours into my 24-hour <laughs> journey into this book. So let me read it again to remind you. Only joined can the curses be undone. Only after one of six has won, when the original offense has been committed again, and a ruling line has come to an end, only then can history amend. Which, uh, again, shows up for the first time on page 135. So the prophecy of this book is the plot of this book, uh, at least until like the halfway point when the heart suddenly shows up and the heart isn't in the prophecy. Uh, the prophecy is bad, it's badly written, it sounds bad when you read it and it is bad in terms of being a prophecy but also every single character misinterprets it uh the prophecy though also seems to misinterpret itself because all of the characters unanimous incorrect readings turn out to be entirely correct so prophecy prophecy as a thing is like an old old thing i don't really know if i need to give you a citation or a year it's Prophecies have probably been around in some form or another in many, many cultures for a very, very long time. You know, as long as we've been predicting the future in any sort of way, we've been, you know, having prophecies. And we've also been telling stories where, you know, predicting the future leads to ruin. And prophecies are basically like a way to do that. You know, it's if you hear your son will kill you, then you send him away and then you'll meet him again, not knowing he's your son and he'll still kill you. You know, if you think a prophecy means that you're going to die, it turns out that, oh no, the death is not a literal death and you'll actually be fine. Prophecies are usually devices meant to play with fate and free will. Uh, very often they combine metaphors and wordplay. Um, the resolution of a good prophecy in like fiction is usually that at the end the reader can go, oh my gosh, it was right there all along without it being a 100% literal straight read. It should be a thing where at the end of the, you know, prophecy... Ideally, you're going to look back and be like, it all came true. But you should still be surprised about that fact in some way, because it's kind of boring if it's entirely literal. But Lightlurk's prophecy is. It's entirely literal. It has no wordplay. It has no, you know, trickery to it. It's very vague, yet all the characters agree on one way, and it rolls out exactly that one way. So let's break it down for a second. Uh, the first two lines, uh, only joined can the curses be undone, only after one of six has won. Okay, uh, so the curses can only be stopped by something or someone being joined. Joined is very vague. Uh, it could be working together, marriage, being in the same vicinity, joining different peoples together, artifacts, countries. Uh, it's a paired line, obviously, it's a stanza, so we can assume it's a direct link. There are six rulers and six realms. The idea that the six realms would be the ones who joined together, or the six rulers specifically, as they represent their realms, is a really obvious link. One of these joined people, like six, must win. Win is a weird term. Uh, what are they winning? A card game? A fight to the death? Are they doing a race? Uh, hmm. If we step back a bit, uh, even this is pretty vague. Uh, you know, if we want to say that maybe the six isn't actually the realms and rulers, which... It almost certainly is, but it's not necessarily strictly stated. You know, who's to say it isn't like a six-entry dog race? But the characters all understand this first third pretty loosely, pretty correctly, I'd say. They all show up at the Centennial. They all host little demonstrations, which are sort of like contests, so that there can technically be a winner. Um, the only thing, though, that doesn't make sense about this 
is that the line is clearly, you know, one of six must win and you all have to get together. It's in there. However, this is the fifth centennial ever. And it is the first time they have ever invited Nightshade. They've never invited Grimm before. They've just purposely not sent him an invitation card for 500 years because they don't like him. And the prophecy is very explicitly, you know, one of six. There has to be six of you. I know that there's still technically six of you if Grimm isn't there. But you really have to be. Don't you want to break these curses, guys? It... So, you know, it's it's ridiculous. I mean, in the fourth centennial, Cleo doesn't show up either. So there was a centennial, the last one, where there were only four people at it. So that's cool. I mean, the prophecy is just like, you guys need to get together, all six of you. And Oro, the guy in charge of inviting people, literally rotting away the longer the curses remain, is just like, nah, I don't like Grim, though. Okay. Next stanza. When the original offense has been committed again. Yeah, I mean, this is pretty much just a sentence that doesn't even rhyme with itself. These two lines are the most direct, so I agree with the book on this. Go do the original offense. The issue, of course, being no one knows what the original offense is. I mean, if you, if you all, if you and all your pals committed ritual, blood, sacrifice, suicide together, and this was the prophecy you got in return, wouldn't you be kind of pissed off? <laughs> So, uh, last stanza. And a ruling line has come to an end. Only then can history amend. You can kind of just ignore the last line about history amending. It's just there to rhyme. So, we just have the sentence, and a ruling line has come to an end. A ruling line coming to an end means a lot of things. You could marry another ruler and merge kingdoms, or you could kind of probably just marry somebody else and change your last name, and it would be like, you know, the... I don't know any, you know, the crowns have ended and now we are the, you know, the scepter royal line. And, you know, it's kind of cheating, but that's often what prophecies are about. You know, just change your last name. You could step down from being a ruler and just be, you know, that special magic dude who has to have kids or we'll all die if he accidentally trips down the stairs. You know, a ruling line could even be some magical line that ends like a magical border or some sort of written law that must be broken. It's a very vague thing. However, all of the characters agree and have agreed for 500 years that this can only mean murder. To them, they hear ruling line must come to an end and they say, hey, you gotta, you gotta kill each other. <laughs> a realm must die, in fact, they say repeatedly, even though it plainly doesn't mention the genocide that that entails. It doesn't say a realm must die, it says a ruling line must die. Are they linked? Yes, but they're not totally linked. They all clearly debate about themselves. One of us has to die and their kingdom all has to die with them, you know? And wh where, where, where? So um, let, let's talk about the fact that they all agree about this murder thing for a second. After getting these prophecies, everyone had like a hundred year chill down period to think about them. They didn't actually know the storm was going to stop. It's not in the prophecy. But when it did, the rulers saw that, I guess, and decided to go alone, no, no armies, no friends, anything, and meet up. They didn't know how long this period of clear skies was going to last. You know, not in the prophecy. So the rulers thus spent a hundred days trying to murder each other nonstop and killed a bunch of civilians in the process. You know, it's lucky they got off the island before the storm kicked up again, because again, they would have had no way of knowing when it was going to stop. None of them killed each other, but they didn't even try to do anything else. They just went straight to murder. After that first centennial, we know they made some rules and structures based on their one specific agreed reading of the prophecy. So, okay, first off, someone has to win. So let's set the first 25 days up to be a loose competition. That way we will have a winner of the six of us. Minus Grimm, obviously, because screw him. Uh, second, uh, we need to repeat the original offense that cast the curses in the first place. Obviously, no one knows what that is, so... Day 25 to 50, we'll be splitting into teams to go search for clues together. That's fun. Uh, oh, three? Okay, so three, a ruling line must end. Well, if one of us dies without an heir, their whole realm does too. So one of us must die, and none of us can have kids. Let's dedicate days uh, 50 to 100 to a lawless free-for-all deathmatch. Also, point four here. Just a feeling, but do you guys think the person who breaks the curses will get unimaginable godlike power? I, I do. Let's let's accept that as fact. Let's, it's basically for sure implied in the prophecy anyways. 
So yeah, they love these rules so much that when they first get to the island, they all have to do a magic blood oath bonding ritual. Uh, the terms of the oath are that if you break the rules, you don't get to get the godlike powers they all imagine is implied, which is a penalty so minor, everyone should secretly have kids. Because if you die without an heir, every single person in your country dies too. The prophecy doesn't say a realm must die, but even if you think it does, having a realm, like having an heir means that your realm won't ever be the one that dies because if you do wind up getting killed, you just have an heir and works it. Like it doesn't break the prophecy, but you know, surely your intention should be that breaking the prophecy and killing somebody is not your realm. So come on, seek your kids, guys. Of course, there's also a really critical flaw in all of this that hopefully has occurred to you immediately. It certainly was the first thought I had. So we have the structure, we have this reading of the prophecy. What happens if someone dies at a centennial, but the original offense wasn't committed for a second time? Suddenly, there aren't six realms to compete in contests and together. Without understanding the original offense, there's no way to break the prophecy. Yet for 500 years, everyone has been entirely focused on murdering each other, something which would not break the curses on its own, and would in fact softlock them from ever being able to break the curses. No one has ever died at the Centennial. Uh, Azul, Oro, Cleo, Celeste, Slash, Aurora, and Grimm, when he's invited, are all over 500. They were alive when the curses happened. Grimm and Oro are both noted war heroes. They have never been able to kill each other, any of them. But they've also never been able to kill any of Isla's ancestors. Because Isla has had a series of ancestors. We actually know for a fact that it's not like her mother lived and went to all of the Centennials until she suddenly died. We know that it was a series of Isla's ancestors, like a different person at each Centennial. And none of them were killed by any of these ancient immortals. Okay. Uh, especially unlikely when one considers the pairing up. So before the fifth year, when they got Grimm involved, there's always been an odd number of participants, which means that there's one person who's stuck on their own. If they're so desperate to murder, why hasn't a team of two ever beaten up the one solo person and killed them? Why wouldn't you all team up and just kill the solo person? Because that way none of your realms die and, you know, screw the solo person. They're probably the most, like, least unpopular. That was a confusing sentence, but you know what I mean. And again, again, just a, just another reminder, the death of a ruler or the realm is not actually in the prophecy. Even if, though, we do accept the book's understanding of its own prophecy, we're left with a bunch of idiots who are leaping to Murder Island for no reason. The, the, the correct reaction to this prophecy is simple. It's teamwork. It even says to join together, even if there can only be one winner. All the rulers should have spent every centennial working together to discover what the original offense was. Once they knew, they could recreate it, and then the death match can begin. In fact, there's nothing in the prophecy that even calls for the centennial. Oro can't leave the island, so why isn't he spending all century long searching for clues? Lightlark is apparently a lovely place, despite the eternal storm of trapped souls. Why don't the rulers just like, move their realms back to the island so they can live there nonstop. Like, wildlings, okay, wildlings are the only ones whose curse is a threat to other people, but you can't convince me that the skylings couldn't just get on their boats and sail back. Like, they're not going to impact the society at all. They're skylings. So, at day 60 of the uh, plot, Oro does actually call a progress meeting, if you'll remember, something which he should have been doing weekly for 500 years. Uh, Azul, at that meeting, actually asks why they aren't all working together to solve this original offense thing. And Oro rebuffs him with, like, we don't have time for that. We can't all focus on one thing. Like, we just don't have time. And it's like, yeah, maybe you don't have time day 60 of the fifth centennial when you're also, like, dying actively, Oro. But if you'd spend more than 25 days each centennial working on the issue rather than running around allegedly trying to kill each other, maybe, maybe... You wouldn't be down to the wire here. So, characters and uh, romance while we're at it. Let's, let's talk about all the characters, like, actually. For a book that has really only six important characters in it, Lightlark is very shy about fleshing any of them out. We have the rulers, uh, those are our main six, and then we have a couple side characters, the side characters being Isla has two tutors, who I haven't used their names once because it's not important, 
Um, Isla has a maid. Her name's Ella, and she's a reoccurring something, but nothing. And then there's a light lark information broker named Juniper. Uh, Tudors, the Tudors have two scenes in the book, really. They bookend the plot, and they appear in, like, short flashbacks. Uh, the maid, Ella, she's always kind of peripheral. She's just sort of like a tool that brings Isla food or silently tends to her needs. And Juniper, the information man, he might as well be a post box. Okay, but then let's look at the rulers, because they are our main characters, okay? Azul does quite literally nothing of note and only exists in the background for the majority of the book. Cleo, despite being a mean girl to harass Isla, is also simply a way for huge portions of the story. Both are dropped entirely by the climax and get resolved with a sentence in the epilogue. Okay, uh, yeah, okay, well at least there's a four, but w wait, wait, wait. Celeste does very little, having few scenes where she primarily like worries about the bond breaker, plans about the bond breaker, or is just sort of like a supportive friend to Isla. And when she turns out to be the villain, she's even more flat. She's just a brand new character who introduces new backstory. She has a really bad motive and she's only there for like two chapters. So who's left to have characterization? Okay, Grimm. Well, Grimm, Grimm isn't growing or changing. He knows who he is and he specifically knows who Isla is. He's popping in to spy on her changing or lurk in her room and hitting on her relentlessly re-seducing the girlfriend whose memories he stole, again. He does not have an arc of his own, only an, an arc in how Isla reacts to him. And when that changes, he does. But with his twist, we can understand his actual feelings and motive never sincerely change. He's a static point. The only characters who appear to have any sort of change, growth, or depth of any kind in Lightlark are Oro and Isla. And even then, it's Pretty much just Oro, who is clearly entirely changed by the plot of this book. Okay. Let's go through the characters one by one. Azul. Uh, Azul is a gay man who can't fly and is sad because his husband is dead. And like, that's a big, that's a big mood. Uh, but that's it. Azul apparently lost his husband during the second centennial. His husband wasn't a Skyling. That's what we know. Since he attends the... Uh, Centennial, but yeah, since then he attends the Centennial but doesn't participate in the murder part. I mean, again, no one does, but rather he mostly just goes to mope on the beach and stare at the eternal storm. Because apparently, when someone dies from a curse related issue, their soul goes to the storm and you can hear vague whispers from it. When the curse gets lifted, apparently the trapped souls leave the storm to walk to the beach before fading, and Azul maybe sees his husband again. I have to keep saying, like, apparently and maybe because the book does not confirm or deny any of these insane details. Azul is allegedly a jovial guy who like likes music but literally he and the Skylings could be a hundred percent removed from the book and nothing would change. He has extreme dies in the second book protecting Isla energy like that's how I would describe him. Okay uh Cleo. Cleo is an evil bisexual woman who is evil for elaborate reasons such as doesn't like Isla and woman. Cleo has no character at all. She's mean, she likes to be mean to Isla, and thus, that is pretty much all we know about her. She's planning a war or something. She has no personality traits or existence beyond appearing in scenes to glare at Isla. No doubt jealous of how hot and powerful she is. And yeah, there is um LGBT rep in this book. Uh, the LGBT rep in this book being the tragic gay and the evil bi. Their sexuality is both revealed in passing you know, not actually in canon, but by being told by Oro, the love wins. Um, you know, it's not like I didn't walk into this book expecting or wanting LGBT rep, but what we have feels extremely crammed in last minute. It really does feel like the author was looking at extremely minor characters and was like, I bet people will be very positive to me if I just quickly change, you know, Azul's wife to a husband. And so she did. Celeste and Aurora, or Celeste slash Aurora, you know, same person. So Celeste is, at first, just a friend and sort of quest giver to Isla. She doesn't appear to have any inner world. We learn nothing about her life and backstory uh, beyond just, like, her role in helping Isla and being Isla's friend. At first, it's 
kind of sweet and nice to see a positive female friendship where they regard each other as trusted allies and friends and like sisters. And then we get the villain twist. You know, YA fantasy light lark, like light lark has a certain compulsion to have very few female characters and even fewer like positive ones. Often the female lead winds up surrounded by men who either want to, you know, have sex with her or support her, facing off against a woman who is often a scorned lover of one of her love interests or both of her love interests. You know, so speaking of Aurora, uh, Aurora, we hear very little about Aurora before the twist. She is mentioned twice simply as Oro's brother's fiance. She is then revealed to have been Celeste and the villain all along, but she still only exists in the book for like one sequence of events, which takes place over a chapter or two. She's a very weak villain. Um, as Celeste, she does not really use her closeness to Isla to manipulate her particularly. As Aurora, she just sort of rambles a bunch of new lore and plot twists until she's killed. When you have a twist in your book, it still needs to be established like reality. It should be hinted at even slightly or else makes so much sense that like the moment it's revealed, it's like a puzzle piece finally falling into place. Celeste as a villain is none of those things. She urges Isla to find the bond maker and lies about its power and name to get her to agree. Past that point, she takes no action, contributing so little, there's no space to like even hint that she's not who she seems. And then we have Aurora, an ancient woman whose motive is jealousy over a boy, whose goal is the power she would have gotten if she had married him, 500 years ago, and whose methods are seduction. Like Cleo, she's written to be just sort of a jealous, catty woman, holding onto this grudge for 500 years. Her fiancé cheats on her, and never loved her, then she murders a girl and accidentally curses the world. Rather than this being, I don't know, wake-up call to her, she vows to gain absolute power and control over the world. It's an incredibly boring concept. Okay, let's go into Grimm. Let's, let's talk about Grimm for a second. Oh, Grimm. Let, let me read you a quote. Let me read you a quote about Grimm. He looked shamelessly, eagerly, at Isla's tight, sexy dress. Sorry, I should actually say that that is a... I don't know how to use it. It's a little bracket because I cut out some of the dialogue here in words. But he's looking at how sexy she is. Like it was important to commit every inch to memory. She had never been studied so thoroughly. His dark eyes seemed to get even darker as they met hers. I'm not sure what I enjoy more, seeing the way you grip a sword or the way your dress grips you. It's page 63. Okay. What if a pervert had unbelievable shadow powers? Grimm is a character you would think is hard to screw up because he's just the Darkling from Shadow and Bone, but hornier. But Grimm is a mistake of creation. He's extremely creepy, he does the whole toxic mind wipe thing, and he mixes this sort of annoying, smart Alec, like, grinning with edgy monster musings. Not only does this man say, I am the monster, with a straight face, the book repeats it in, like, italic thoughts to really hammer it in. Uh, this man practically, like, wears a t-shirt with a low-res stolen photo and aerial font saying, fine, make me your villain, on it. Like, the book is so lax on describing other characters, there's very little proof he isn't. For all he and Isla, like, and the book try to claim that he is this dark, edgy, dark, sexy, scary, evil, sexy villain, he never is. Not in the way he thinks. Here's some quotes about him. He was the thing of nightmares, the monster in the dark, page 160. Grimm's darkness left nothing behind. He had turned back to the cliff. Hand fisted at his side, a hand that wielded terrible, terrible power. Page 191. Here's a quote from him specifically. I could open a black hole that would swallow the beach. I could turn the sea dark as ink and kill everything inside it. I could demolish the castle brick by brick from where we stand. I could take you back to nightshade lands with me right now. His voice was deep as dreams, dark as nightmares. I could do all those things, and I might, if I didn't think you would hate me for it. It's page 192. And uh, the implication there being, of course, that he might cause a mass extinction event, like, for kicks? If only Isla, you know, wouldn't dislike that. Okay. So Grimm, Grimm is strong. He's powerful. The book is obsessed with it. 
his shower, his shadows, and extreme power. Uh, he demonstrates the largest number of powers and range. Evidently, his unique special flair is teleportation, but he can also do just an insane amount of stuff. We really don't know much about him, despite his role as a romantic lead. Uh, he fought in the Sunling Nightshade War a few decades before the curses. He killed thousands of people and was known for that. And end of lore. Uh, he is from Nightshade, which isn't liked or trusted by the other realms, but it's also been separated from Lightlark and the other realm for thousands of years. And this is his first centennial, so his notion that he, like, grew up as an outsider is pretty illogical by that notion. Like, he's an outsider to Lightlark, but in his community, he's the ruler and probably quite liked. Uh, Grim's insistence that he is a monster and the villain is undercut by the fact he doesn't do anything bad. I mean, he hasn't. Um... I'm not wild about the thousands, you know, he's killed, but it is commonly acceptable in war. Uh, during the centennial, he's generally like really flippant, but he he like participates throughout and does nothing to stir the pot particularly. Like he makes some sarcastic comments, but not even that sarcastic. He's kind of just chilling along. Most of Grimm's dialogue is flirting with Isla. Uh, right at the gate, he's grinning at her uh, with one dimple apparently and hitting on her and this continues until they bone and she's willing to give up untold power to try and run away with him Grimm's relentless horniness for isla is pretty much always gross uh she routinely acts pissed off or doesn't reciprocate very flustered but then he continues and on day of knowing her well yeah he's following her invisibly and secretly spying on her getting a dress tailored the romance arc feels awfully lot like him wearing Isla down. She finds him attractive, but immediately decides not to trust him, seeing as he's a nightshade, one of the immortal participants in this deadly game, and she has more important goals. She finds his flirting annoying, sometimes disgusting or unsettling. Usually she responds by glaring, you know, daggers, obviously, at him. Yet somewhere in all of the side quests, she gets over these hurdles and she falls for him. It's partially horniness, but mostly just the inevitability of him being an edgy, hot villain dude. Um, so that's grim. Wait, wait there's something I'm for- Oh, right, right, right. There's something I, I haven't mentioned yet in all of that detail. Grim is taking advantage of a very young girl. Twice. So, Grim wiped Isla's memories entirely. But they used to be in love. Deep passionate love with lots of hot sex that Isla can dream about. She even thinks Grimm is sending her these dreams, but they're memories. You know, lovely, powerful love where he didn't trust her abilities and did a horrifying act without her consent. A love where he met her when she was a sheltered, naive, abused girl who was barely a legal adult when they met and whose father he knew for many years. And oh, wait, this is extremely creepy, isn't it, huh? We know very little about their history, but they met when she was 18. We're going to presume that. We, they met a year ago. Isla is nearly two decades old. She's probably 19. So we're going to say that she was 18 when they met, and they were in love. Isla grew up constantly monitored and controlled by two tutors who are shaping her specifically and only for the centennial, lying about her parents and her powers to better control her. She was put through nonstop training to a very abusive, horrific degree. She was not allowed friends or visitors or to go anywhere alone, you know, or pretty much anywhere at all, even accompanied. She had barely spoken to a man before, let alone done anything physical. Then when she's 14, she finds her star stick. We don't know how often or how long she goes out on trips with it, but she starts to see the world. She meets Celeste, her only friend. As she gets to travel, it's um, probably only for short bursts. And she remains a virgin who still lacks over, like, key information about the world and is called very trusting, basically. Quite naive, in fact. Celeste certainly says that. Grimm accidentally meets her when she accidentally, like, teleports into his castle. We're missing a lot of information beyond here, but Grimm, who is 540 years old, like, minimum, who's been a ruler for most of that, who is the most powerful magic person, it seems, in the world, is completely smitten by this young girl. She keeps coming back. He's her first kiss, he's who she first had sex with, and she he's who she falls deeply in love with in less than a year. He also knows deep secrets about her that he does not tell her. He knows she isn't powerless, the secret that ca haunts her constantly, and he knows the truth about her parents, the truth that her father was one of his generals, in fact. In an eternal monarchy, 
not at war, where people with lots of magic live for centuries, Isla's father was one of Grimm's most powerful gener generals, so he likely was friends with Grimm for many years. And now Grimm is boning that guy's daughter, without telling the daughter this at all. And then we get to the mind wipe. Famously. Very bad. Grimm says he does this out of love, and I believe he thinks this, but it's horrendously bad, and he doesn't own up to it. Grimm then goes, already in love with Isla, already having had sex with her many times, knowing all of her secrets, the ones she knows and the ones she doesn't know, knowing all of her favorite things. He then goes through the process of flirting with her, hitting on her, creeping around her, seducing her, charming her, having sex with her, again. Th this is horrendously creepy and toxic. And uh, do, do I need to explain that to you? I hope not. So Grimm is locked from having an arc or a romance story or anything really like that because his feelings don't change for her. He always loves Isla. She just doesn't know it yet. But she will. He'll make sure she does. <sighs> okay, so. Oro? Let's talk about Oro. Uh, let me read you a quote. Uh, this is from the very end of the book. Like, uh, this is basically like the epilogue-ish section of the book. She saw her own emotions reflected in his eyes. Confusion. Not knowing how it happened. Just that it did. Love was a strange thing. She wanted him in so many ways. Had for a while, though she had tried her best to deny it. More than anything, she trusted him. Was that the basis of love? She still wasn't sure. Of anything. The so, page 347. You, you gotta like a love interest who is entirely shocked by the revelation at the end of the book that he was a love interest at all. Because what is the basis of love anyways? Are all romance stories at their heart just a quiet, very long moment where you look into your beloved's eyes and think, wait, I'm confused, since when has this been a thing? Oro and Isla are the only characters who are in some way not static, but that doesn't mean that they're good characters. Oro is, again, perhaps the one who changes the most, but he's still just kind of abandoned by the plot's need to weave in subplots and side adventures. He spends many characters, like many chapters, in that white void doing nothing and emerging each time a slightly nicer man. Oro was a paranoid king afraid for his dying island and the fact that people kept trying to use him for his immense power. When he met Isla, he doesn't know that she's powerless and assumes she's just another, like, seductress trying to get his powers. But when she rebuffs him constantly and directly tells him she's uninterested in him or his power, and with his lie detecting abilities he knows she's truthful, he's able to let his guard down and he winds up falling for her. And that's a pretty solid plot for romance, but there's a problem. Grimm is the hot, sexy, bad boy, evil villain, demon, monster man. Grimm's the one Isla has the constant scenes with, mostly of sensual touching and explicit innuendo. Green scene, Grimm's scenes are all romance and desire, in fact, and you know that he's the one who's going to win this love triangle. Even after what he's done, you know book two, that's the end game. It's obvious. Especially when Oro isn't actually written like a love interest. Isla barely notes his appearance compared to how much she drools over Grimm. She has a lot of solo scenes and chapters with Oro thanks to them pairing up, but they're mostly arguments, plot-related, or Isla quizzing him on backstory and lore. The most flirting they do is when they go swimming together on the hunt for the heart. They stare at each other's bodies briefly and, you know, or Oro kind of like quizzes if she's a virgin and it's a little bit teasing and a little bit like they're looking at each other, but even then, it doesn't really sound the same as when she is talking about Grimm and Grimm's beautiful body. Like, the scene where they go bathing together is that she notices uh, Oro having his shirt off and is like, stares at him. And even then, she's not really t seeming to drool over him that much. And then she basically, he notices, he's like, oh, yeah, I bet you've seen lots of naked boys before. And she's like, oh, yeah, totally. But she's lying and he knows that she's lying. And so he gets a little bit of a smirk. But then she takes off all of her clothes and she's really hot. And so he stares at her and is into it. And that is pretty much the breadth of their whole, you know, <laughs> romance and sexual arc, if I really had to describe it. Like, if that was grim in that described scene, they'd be dry humping by now. 
But they're super businesslike. They barely touch at all until they're in deep mutual love. Um, half the physical contact they have before that point is basically just Isla attacking him, especially when he's injured. And is, is that love? You know, you still got to give Oro credit. He has more than one personality tra trait, and he changes as a result of the plot, making him by far the most complex story element in all of Lightlark, the most complex character in all of Lightlark, and maybe even the only character in all of Lightlark. Hey, let's talk about Isla. Let's really, really, really talk about Isla. Okay, let me read you a real quote from this book. A real quote from this real book. She played not with dolls, but with blades. She did not braid her hair, but wove vo vines in to make shields. Yeah, okay. So that's page 338. Um, of course, Isla's hair is actually braided for the most majority of the book. Uh, she explicitly ties it into a braid at points. But yeah, it's cool. She, she doesn't, you know, braid her hair. She makes shields. She doesn't play with dolls. She, she's so good at the sword. Yeah, Isla has, um, she has real not like other girl energy. I'm going to stop shifting around. Yeah, um, real heavy not like other girl energy. She, I'm surprised she never says that. I mean, that quote basically is that. Um, but it's already clear just looking at the other two women in this book and pretty much in this universe if we want to get real because her tutors betray her and are evil. Uh, Celeste betrays her and is evil and just sort of a scorned woman. Cleo is completely evil. The only female character in this book who isn't anything is Ella, the maid, who is a maid and doesn't do anything and just sort of exists to um, help Isla and praise Isla. So that's cool. Isla is a weak protagonist. Uh, she is constantly defining herself in the book and her actions with pretty much direct lies, I would call them. She gives the impression that she's growing, changing, and imperfect when... In truth, she is a static, like, slate in need of a serious nerf. Uh, Isla is absolutely perfect. She is more trained than any of the immortal warlords around her at the tender age of 19. She is trained in every weapon and technique and does not miss a throw. She can sneak and blend in as silently as a ghost, using her alchemy skills to concoct potions and her charm to get out of any situation. She's a master of observation and self-taught herself lockpicking and pickpocketing. She is unbelievably beautiful and attractive, with a singing voice exceptional even for the gifted wildlings, and knows all of the dances too. She can climb sheer walls and swim arctic waters, endure ludicrous pain, and be better in like a day or two. Her only flaw is that she has no powers, but secretly she is so powerful, her powers subdued her curses and hid away. Isla can do anything, and every man will fall deeply in love with her, and she ends the book with ruler-level powers of Wildling and Starling, very powerful nightshade powers, and two hot boyfriends worth of powers too, which include ruler-level Sunling and nightshade powers. Isla is a Mary Sue. And I try to avoid terms like that. Um, it's a specific trope that is often misused in meaning, but there's just no way to understand her that isn't defined by her exceptional abilities beyond logic. She is a Mary Sue. Isla's only flaw is her being sheltered and naive, but this is not that important. It's mostly told to us and we can assume it, but it doesn't lead to her, like, her, um being sheltered and naive doesn't lead to her really trusting the wrong people. Because we can look at her trusting Grimm, for example, immediately as perhaps being sheltered or naive. But it isn't really treated as a result of that character trait. It's treated much more as a result of just, like, Grimm being so unbelievably sexy and good and powerful and strong. Not that Isla is the one who has made a mistake, because she doesn't trust him initially. The most she does is, you know, keep hanging out with him. It's Celeste who tells us, or Aurora, who says, like, oh, you know, you poor thing, you're so naive, etc. But that is just told to us. We don't actually see her make actions that reflect this sort of flaw. You know, while she maybe, again, trusts the wrong people perhaps too quickly, she also trusts the right people perhaps 
too quickly. And then she's betrayed by them, both the right people and the wrong be people believe her, <laughs> like betray her. I can't even speak because that's how much, ugh. You know, she is just too passive of a character to actually be blamed for her actions. Um, you know, Isla, like by the end of the book, essentially seems to be standing still as other characters lie and betray her one after another, sometimes even lying about betraying her or betraying her by lying. And she is just sort of sitting there reacting to it one after another after another until the book ends. As much as Isla is running around being cool and good at murder and scary and perfect, she's barely a conduit for the narrative, entirely led around by the actions and directions of others. Even her apparent rebellious streak is fully guided by Celeste. Her romances are not choices, but carefully groomed. Uh, Grimm, you know, really quite grooming her. And um, it's an accident, basically. She falls in love with Oro. Except for the fact that, of course, from her whole life, she's been raised to seduce Oro. The few times that she is leading other characters around are generally inexplicable. Like in the climax where she realizes that the heart is an egg laid by a random bird she just needs to follow. But... Isla really disagrees with me about all of this. Uh, let, let me read this sort of reflection thing. So much had changed. She wasn't the same person who had arrived on the island two months prior. Before, she had never even spoken to a man unsupervised for more than a few minutes. Now, one had touched her up and down her body. Before, she thought she would cower before the rulers. Now, she had beaten them in trials, threatened them. She had even saved the king. Before, she believed it was wrong to want anything other than to break her and her realm's curses. Now, she wanted everything. It's page 240. Everything. Isla's motives do change based on whoever is currently betraying her, but they remain entirely focused on breaking her and the wildling curses and escaping to travel the world of Celeste. She calls herself a caged bird, but for five years she's been escaping. Her motive has always been to free herself and run away. You know, has her motive, has this trait or motive changed at all over the course of the book? I don't think so. She wants the same things. She values the same things. So what is that everything that she's talking about? Is it just getting laid? Her opinion of herself doesn't even change that much, despite the above. She enters the island immediately and rightfully quite confident in her skills. She easily bests Grimm and Oro in a duel right away. And then she spends a very long time reflecting on how weak she is without having any powers. This would kind of reflect a uh, lack of confidence as a character trait if she wasn't so unflappable about her many skills and wasn't demonstrably equal or on greater footing than the powered rulers. This is why the book really feels like it is lying whenever Isla thinks about herself. There are these assertions so clearly stated, but they have no backing to them. Uh, like, here's a quote of what her tutor had said to her. You are a rose without thorns, her tutor had said. A pretty thing capable of protecting itself. If only. That's page 169. But who is Isla to other people? How do others see her? Besides obviously wanting to jump her bones. So Cleo instantly views her as a threat, attempting multiple times to kill her, and is generally just catty. Uh, Celeste is tricking her, viewing her as a tool, capable of doing what Celeste could never do in terms of seducing Oro and finding the Bondbreaker. Here's Celeste talking about Isla, and I don't think she's being manipulative here. This is just her putting on some real praise, because it's true, the book says. You move like a shadow, Celeste continued. You strategize like a general. You can blend in anywhere. I've seen you. That's page 86. Yeah, Azul barely exists, but a constant thread in the book is that uh, at the very beginning, uh, she Isla gives him a diamond when they first meet. And he treasures and wears that diamond repeatedly, all the time, because he just, and he's friendly to her all the time. He loves this diamond. And yeah, he just instantly is like, loves her. So that's, you know, again, she's just that charming and nice and lovely and cool. Uh, here's Oro talking about Isla. I have watched you. You are a chameleon, becoming everything everyone wants you to be, all of the time. That's page 200. So... Isla is everything in the world. A rose, a shadow, a general, a chameleon. She's so talented, she once witnessed people in a dark alley from a distance, pick a lock, and then became a master lockpick because of that. Like, this girl is unstoppable. The only time she, like, ever falters at all in the book is because she makes, like, stupid mistakes once or twice. 
And I really don't even count this as like her fault or a deliberate character trait. I think the only two real errors in her perfection were written to just add a bit of action in some kind of dull scenes. At one point, she is disguised as a moonling and annoyed that she doesn't find the bond breaker, she is carelessly running to the castle and she's spotted and she has to like hide. And she gets away with that fine, there's no consequences. Later, she's disguised as a skyling and she runs into another skyling. And she panics so much that she's been caught that she just stands there with like a slack jaw blankly until the other Skyling civilian is like, hi, and that's it. It doesn't have any consequences or mean anything and is honestly out of character for her because she's so confident in every other aspect. You know, moves like a shadow, strategizes like a general. Yeah, and also, this is a f fun, ridiculous fact. Isla is the only person in the world allowed to do something truly special wear a variety of colors. Yeah, uh, this is a world building thing, but uh, each realm has a special color. Uh, they are pretty much exactly what you'd expect. Uh, Nightshade is black, Sunling is gold, um, Moonling is white, Starling is silver. Uh, they're all kind of, oh, Skyling is light blue. So they're pretty much all uh, monochrome sort of, or uh, metallic tones, except for the blue there. Um, but Wildlings isn't green, which is what you'd expect. Uh, the quote on it is, because nature was multicolored, Isla was not bound to one shade. That's on page 33. So it's not like people turn to dust if they wear the wrong color, but the entire book, every person obeys this color coding and it's implied to be a strict tradition. And it's not just the rulers as the representatives of the realm, all civilians are wearing only the colors of their realms nonstop, which leaves Isla as the only person who can dress however she wants in a variety of colors. Her color of choice is mostly red because dramatic rose whatever but she she wears a variety of things because she's that special uh okay here's another section on my isla section uh ki killing people uh let's talk about murder for a second like let's just let's just skirt away here and just talk about murder ya sort of has this weird relationship with murder these days uh killing people you know specifically whatever we had this real peak of dark fantasy, and this book, despite all its whimsical world building, obviously considers itself dark fantasy. Dark fantasy is a vague genre in, like, YA specifically. Um, it generally in YA means the main character will kill and be good at it. I don't really know who to blame. It's probably Sarah J. Maas. But at some point, uh, the young adult genre, and especially, like, fantasy young adult, became obsessed with assassins, spies, killing each other. Specifically to the act of killing without regrets or any feeling but like satisfaction, of being able to kill lots of people and instantly move on, of being like underestimated but then being amazing at murder. Uh, Isla is a trained warrior but she hasn't seen any war and any combat that she would have faced at all that wasn't training would have been animals because at times she is said to be like abandoned in the woods during her training process. So as much as her training would have prepared her and her tutor's abusive method, uh, methods would have probably forced her to kind of close off emotionally, which isn't something we see in her character at all, actually fighting for your life is different and killing is especially so. So, um, hey, murder is bad. Murder is also hard. It takes a lot of mental training and a certain kind of personality to become comfortable with taking lives in any context. Like, for example, look at PTSD in the military. You can say that the act is legal, and you can say it's uh, morally fine if you want, but even people who feel entirely justified in a military setting where it's considered acceptable and encouraged to kill people, like, very, very often have extreme PTSD from it because it's that difficult. Watching someone die leaves a mark like taking life with consent, like assisted suicide, is still a momentous task. Killing someone in self-defense, even in a desperate scenario, can still very often be really scarring. When you kill someone, you probably have to look at yourself and what you feel, what this means to me, what you think this makes you, and if you feel guilt for the people around the person you've killed, whose lives you have permanently altered. It's a big thing. It, it really is like a huge facet of just like human psyche. Like, assassins are generally trained to remove that empathy, and it's a complicated issue in many ways all around. There's no one way to say, like, this is the correct way people always should behave in regard to murder and killing. I'm not saying that any book where someone kills someone else needs to then devolve into a therapy session, 
But I am saying it's not a small incidental act, especially to kill for the first time. By the way, I uh, just want to say that if you are interested in like assassins and cool murder and like thoughts about being what a trained killer would do to a young girl's psyche and like both powerful assassin stuff, but also well thought out about like the psychological side and the other sides of that. Uh, the Butterfly Assassin by Finn Longman is an incredible young adult book. That's a new release. Uh, highly recommend that. Uh, so Isla, uh, halfway through the book, is attacked by some assassins Cleo has hired. She is caught unaware and restrained by their water powers, but Celeste shows up and frees her. And then she kills these assassins in rapid succession. She's smirking with confidence at her incredible skills. She dual wields daggers, throws both at once, landing both in her target's hearts exactly. Uh, this is her reaction to staring at like all of the dead bodies that she and Celeste have created. Once she might have had the urge to vomit, but she had been on the island 40 days. In that time, she had dueled against famed rulers, survived countless trials, swallowed down unspeakable pain, pulled barbs from her back with her bare hands. She stood straight and steady, remembering how the men had threatened her, remembering how weak she had felt, chained in place, powerless against power. Never again, she promised herself. Page 178. So as much as this is self-defense, and she was indeed momentarily close to death because of her lack of power, the reaction is still kind of puzzling. She's not desperately fighting back when she's freed. She is freed, and then she's like dancing, basically, with her weapon. She's smiling and grinning and having a great time. She kills three men with ease. And specifically here, she points out that she once might have vomited, and being here on the island for 40 days are... Like, it's hardened her. These are her first kills, and doing trials like a tea party and swimming have turned her into a steady assassin. The scene does not matter, and she does not particularly think of it again. These kills are flavor text to show she is a badass. She kills people, and that's it. It's probably worth noting, too, how both Grimm and Oro are also noted to be killers. Grimm especially calls back to the fact that he's killed thousands of people as a legendary warrior, and his capacity for violence and murder is in fact treated as a very sexy, appealing thing. Um, Oro seems more regretful of his time in the army, but still certainly is implied to have also killed thousands of people. And in both of these traits, rather than any sort of weight to this action or idea, in any sort of way, it is only just a, ooh, he's killed thousands of people. That is so sexy. Like, that is how it's treated. And that's really just devalues the idea of killing. And it's something that's a pet peeve of mine in YA fiction. I felt like this bad book was an especially bad offender. Uh, also, let's, let's talk about her fighting skills in general, because I've already sort of highlighted them, and I want to go more into detail about it. So we don't really need to, like, wonder if she's a badass um because she is and let me read you some beautiful quotes of the fight scenes in this book she was light as a dandelion on her feet but strong as the steel of her blade with every advance it was part of her a fifth limb a beautiful gleaming thing each of her motions was a f was faster than the last as she slipped into her rhythm her flow her dance it's page 53 um fifth limb of course not being the term in any way She's holding her sword with her hand. It's an extension of her limbs. A fifth limb implies that she has two hands, two legs, and the sword is in her cleavage, I guess. Okay. She was fluid as water, precise as lightning, fast as a star hurtling to earth. Her swords move independently, in tandem, in a rhythm like the blood pulsing through her veins, like the ringing through the glass dome, echoing the slicing and shattering as Aurora sent more of the woods inside. So um, that's page 339, uh, independently and tandem, being opposites, might be my highlight there. Uh, so it's pretty hard to move, a, you know, your swords independently and in tandem. Uh, here's a scene where the, uh, the enemies ambush her, uh, so that's the lead up. But Isla was ready. She smiled, just a little, and unleashed. Three of her arrows flew at once, each finding their targets. Bodies fell from the high branches. She ducked, barely missing a flying blade, then turned, her sword now in her fist. She gutted the man in front of her who had a dagger to her heart, turned and did the same to a towering woman who had a rusty hatchet aimed at her temple. Throwing stars from her pocket flew from her other hand, into the neck of a man half a moment away from burying his blade into Oro's back. 
That's page two, 292, and it's incredibly fast wielding of many weapons at once. She goes on to kill about like eight people in just a couple seconds, effortlessly and perfectly. And here's another quote, because there's so many. Isla didn't give the guards time to reach for their ice blades or wield the sloshing water held in vials across their belts. Before they could even yell for help, she had hit them in six different places, special points her tutors had taught her to target. Their muscles slackened. One good hit each in the back of the head and they slumped down to the floor, passed out. Not one drop of blood. Page 122. The amount of guard she does this to is never clearly stated, so you can feel free to sub in like she just did amazing pressure point martial art, which she apparently knows, to like a hundred people at once. You know, I honestly wouldn't be that surprised. So Isla laments her lack of powers, but she is insanely talented and unstoppable in every single way. When she's fighting people with powers, without powers, no matter what she's doing, she is easily and very capable of just slaying them. And of course, you know, there's the twist that she actually has like all of the powers in the world as well. So that's cool. You know... All of this, like, over-hyping her strength and power, it's kind of silly. Um, I know it's not really a descriptive word choice, but it's, you know, a light lark is just kind of dumb. Uh, you do have to laugh at some point, you know, when you look at a character like Isla. It's just dumb. And, oh, if you're wondering, just in case you were wondering, Isla, uh, her name, it means island. I mean, it's not short for island, which it almost is. It's, uh, I believe, Spanish for island. But Isla means island, because the book is on an island. So the writing of Light Lark, it's bad. I've read a lot of quotes at this point, so you should know it's bad. Uh, let's take a second to like look at the actual writing quality. I'm going to read some quotes, and I'll go into writing relating to the story, but a lot of it will just be about like the craft of writing the writing as itself, separated from the story, the plot, the characters. Uh, let's just start with a couple like fun little, little fun quotes. So first of all, Ivy crept along the ceiling in a pretty pattern. Page 19. Pretty pattern is one of the least descriptive things you can say. Her face was long and pointed in three places, cheekbones and chin, sculpted like a diamond. It's page 15. That's Cleo, by the way. Uh, the implication there. Pointed in three faces sounds exactly like her face is a triangle, or that she has literal jagged sharp bits. It's understandable that the three places are cheekbones and chin. Poorly described. Uh, here's one of the most famous quotes. Light Lark was a shining, cliffy thing. Page 16. I won't tire of that quote. I've said it multiple times, and yet. A cliffy thing. She realized she had been biting into Oro's hand. It was covered in bite marks. Page 172. It's redundant. The island was a pastry, crumbling into the sea day by day. But at dusk, it was pretty. The sun was a running yolk, smearing gold and orange and red across the sky, as if desperate to leave its mark. The clouds were cotton, dipped in pink dye. Page 259. One of the, um, beyond that, just, uh, but... One of the things that this book definitely has a lot of in, and I'm not really going to go into exact things, um, writing has strict rules and it has extremely non-strict rules. Pretty much all the strict rules you can break in some way, but there's an art to breaking the rules of writing. It's a complicated art form. And one of those things that is just a rule, as it were, that the book violates quite a bit is the island was a pastry crumbling into the sea. Usually when you draw a metaphor like that, the thing that you're comparing it to is just, you can say, the island was like a pastry, and like a pastry, it was crumbling into the sea. And just the implication there is that it is typical for pastries to crumble into the sea. What it can be, the island was a past was like a pastry, and it was like a pastry does, crumbling. That is true. But into the sea in the same sentence there implies... This is very, like, pedantic, I know, but this is something the book does quite a lot with its metaphors, where it is technically incorrect. Some of them stand out quite a bit, some of them stand out less, but it pretty much always, like, if you are used to looking at writing a lot, then it stands out a lot as just sort of not very good writing. So, Light Lark has more description than a lot of bad books I've read, um, and I read a lot of bad books. 
Uh, mostly the description is based on the environment and the natural world. Uh, we don't get that much about the characters, believe it or not, despite, you know, having to swoon over Grimm. We're not told that much about, like, how he changes day to day, just like he has dark eyes. So you do have an easy time picturing a lot of the invented fantasy plants and settings, like, you know, there's a golden palace or an underwater castle. Uh, and that might be the only positive thing I'm saying about this book. But even then, that's only because much of the writing is simple. The fantasy plants are things like a plant that opens up when you touch it, a tree that's hollow inside, a tree that has feathers instead of leaves. And that's sort of the full amount of description you get. Like describing a frozen forest or a sunset and having it capable of being pictured is not actually that impressive of an achievement. That's the most basic thing of writing is to say there was a sunset and most people then can be like, I know what a sunset looks like. I can picture this, you know, saying, ah, there's a tree, but instead of leaves, there's feathers. And then most people can be like, I can pretty much imagine that. I know what feathers are. I know what trees are. So it's it's simple. The test of a good description is much more about like what it evokes and what it conveys besides like the 2D idea of it existing. I have a strong imagination, not to brag. I can grasp the concept of a bird being metallic or a castle that floats in the sky. But what else can you tell me about, say, uh, this island, uh, this one star isle, where everything is a glittery silver? What's the sound of wind through the metal trees? You know, what's the feeling of, like, the jagged grass? You know, the way the stars reflect across the water, indistinguishable from the natural sparkle there? Here's how the island is actually described. A bird that looked crafted out of shining metal sat in a tree nearby, beneath a cluster of silver acorns. A metallic snake crept along a branch, its scales like chain metal. They walked through the strangely hued forest for just minutes before coming upon a stream, water silvery in the moonlight. Page 195. And, huh, yeah, um, okay. There are a lot of ideas there of fantasy things, but the only reason they're so easy to imagine is because they're dreadfully simple. Yeah, there's a metal-looking bird. There's a metal-looking snake. There's some silver acorns. The forest is silver, the water is silver. It's just sort of, ah, aesthetic. You know, pointless images that don't convey the world or matter to the action, written in really repetitive language. The language in general in Lightlark is quite simple. I don't think that's necessarily a sin. It's very easy for books to swing too hard the other way and become seemingly antagonistic with their enthusiasm for rarer words. You know, there's nothing wrong with keeping language to a level universally approachable. Uh, even in, you know, especially in YA, uh, but even for commercial YA, which is what the book is, uh, the book reads simplistically, it's lacking strong prose, and occasionally it sounds childish. Um, Isla once, you know, says she has no experience of men, and she describes it as, now one had touched her up and down her body. Uh, Oro often has mean eyes and grins meanly, while Grimm's grin makes her insides puddle. Puddle shows up 23 times in this book, which always stood out to me because I really don't often see that in a lot of books unless you're talking about rain puddles, and it's not rain puddles in this book. And grinning. Grim grin. Grim grin is a phrase seven times this book. So like grim grinned, grim grins, grim grinning is seven times in this book. That combination is there. Grin itself is 61 times. The grinning is nonstop. It's pretty much all by Grimm, but everybody's grinning all the time. It stands out so much and it's so annoying. Uh, the writing simply feels amateur throughout, uh, very much you'd expect from like a teenager's first writing project, though the author is, of course, 27. It's the sort of thing that would immediately get picked up on if brought to like a writing workshop, but I'm not sure that it ever went to a writing workshop. And the editor obviously wasn't particularly bothered for quality either, considering every other aspect of the book. The structure of each page is an issue without even, like, examining the words on them. A large number of sentences are run-ons or fragments, and the majority of paragraphs are one to two sentences long. There are whole pages where each sentence is a new line. This sort of dramatic shortness is actually a wonderful tool for conveying urgency or importance. It puts a lot of emphasis on, like, you know, each line of text. The effectiveness of the technique, though, really relies quite explicitly on being used sparingly. You write denser paragraphs so that the one or two lines on their own are given more weight. This is basic writing. So see, I just did that out loud. I'm reading from my script, and it's it's to give it weight. You give it a pause there. And in that way, the long explanation, you then can sum it up succinctly. It's really good. I do it all the time when I write. Um, writing fiction, writing nonfiction, whatever I do. 
a lot of people do. It's great. Uh, writing fragments and even run-ons are not necessarily sins in writing because they can be very effective in conveying tone, urgency, feeling into your writing, depending on what's going on. But the book is doing that nonstop, which means that it is not an artistic choice at any point. It is just nonstop. Now, I'm going to read this, and it's a little hard speaking out loud uh, to necessarily convey all of the pauses, so I'm going to um, really try to put periods, we'll each have a pause, and then uh, sentence breaks, I'm going to have a longer pause to just really try to show what this looks like, okay? Wind whistled through the corridors from various windows left open. Free, airy, light. The tower wasn't difficult to find. It was one of just a few and had unlocked glass doors, which revealed its interior. Books. Floors of them, in a circular shape, going around and round in a spiral leading up to a rounded skylight. All empty. Celeste was right. No one seemed interested in reading at this hour. Now she just needed to find the protected section. It's page 88. So that is like, I'm not going to do quick math because I didn't do it when I was writing this review. Uh, but that's like like three or four fragments, I want to say. It takes place over one, two, three, four, five um five line breaks, and it's a very small section that could be one paragraph pretty easily. Probably maybe two. And instead, it is five paragraphs, mostly single lines with a bunch of just like dot, dot, dot. It's very jarring and jittery. Um, in between all the fragmented action and the constant line breaks, other types of scenes don't fare much better. Dialogue is a large portion of the book, as it is in most books, uh, but it's filled with cheesy lines like everything I've been reading so far. Uh, the dialogue tags attached to these are not much better. Like, obviously, there's the grinning. There's shooting daggers when you glare, which is one of those writing cliches you see all the time. Uh, rolling eyes. All the while, too, characters' names are often just reduced to their sort of title. So Grimm is often the nightshade, the moonling, uh, which is one of those sort of writing things that uh, a lot of people do, but it's a huge pet peeve for me. So I'd like to just highlight that it exists in this book. It's pretty much like the... I think it's a fan fiction trope at this time where you say, you know, the blonde man, you know, the uh, naturopath, like you, you reduce a person to that rather than using their name. When you use it a lot, it stands out so much and it always bothers me because there's an extra step between saying Grimm and the nightshade where I know Grimm is the nightshade, but your brain takes a second longer to process it and it just kind of can kind of ruin the flow of writing to me, especially. So the book definitely does it. When we don't have cliches, most of the dialogue is plot recaps and Isla asking questions. Oro has multiple scenes devoted to just Isla asking him a series of questions. When she's not interrogating her love interests or surroundings, Isla is often interrogating herself, as the book is full of rambling internal monologues where Isla asks a constant series of questions that she rarely solves. She's constantly being like, why? What could this mean? And... Sometimes she gets the answers, sometimes she doesn't. Uh, it definitely takes up paragraphs and paragraphs of time, where she just wonders things. Light Lark is never an enjoyable read. If you haven't picked that up by the whatever hour mark of this review, I don't know what to tell you. But beyond all the hair-pulling lore and characters and world and plot, the meat of the actual basic writing is not enjoyable either. There's not a spot of good prose or interesting moments, it's just as jittery as the rest. The moments of inspiration in, like, setting and world feel just as much like an aesthetic board as everything else. At some points, literally twice, I felt compelled to look up certain things in Pinterest out of curiosity to see if I'd be able to find exactly what the author was looking at when she wrote it. So how did we get here? It's a good question. Uh, Lightlark's backstory, I think, actually explains a lot. So, according to the author, she came up with Lightlark 10 years ago, which would have been about 2012. Uh, so, at first, this really threw me off. Um, I've been trying to avoid bringing it up, but this book feels in every way extremely inspired by Sarah J. Maas, and I despise what that woman has contributed to this world. So, sorry to break this to you now, this deep into the review, dedicated Sarah J. Maas fans but it feels extremely inspired by it. Look at the villains. Um, if you want to look at the love triangle, the setup of the love triangle, look at Grimm. Uh, like, I know for a fact, uh, I tried reading the first book and I don't, I hated it. But um, I, I can tell you right now, for those also unaware, that uh, Court of Thorns and Roses, which was Sarah J. Moss's like breakout hit first book, 
uh, is a, you know, dark fantasy sort of. It also has pretty shoddy world building, but it's better than Light Lark because everything's better than Light Lark. Uh, it has a thing where basically the main character's first love interest is some guy and he seems great. And then in the second book, it turns out he's really, really bad. And her second love interest is a guy who in the first book shows up and just sort of harasses her a, t a huge amount of time and is sort of a villain. But then in the second book, he just comes and like saves her from her romantic thing. It actually turns out to be perfect in every way. The second guy being, of course, a shadowy guy who all the other rulers of places dislike because he's shadowy and suspicious, but actually he's really nice and his realm is the best of the realms. It's so cool, in fact, and lovely. And he's really, really hot and he's a shadowy, spooky guy. So it's extremely similar in that regard. Um, the villain of the first book as well is literally a evil woman who is like a scorned lover basically who is jealous of the main character because she has these two hot boyfriends basically um where the main villain and again this is very approximate but the main villain of the court of thorns and roses like first book evil woman who is really bad uh she is specifically like abusing or using the shadowy spooky love interest uh in the first book and she is like a vindictive ex of the um other love interests. And that is extremely similar to this book, you might note, where uh, Isla is with Oro. Um, Oro is the brother of uh, Rora's old fiance, which means that uh, Oro is basically like the Aur Aurora dislikes Oro because she's spurned by his brother. And that's extremely similar to um, the Court of Thorns and Roses villain who dislikes the. Um, seemingly nice good boy because he spurned her. Extremely similar. Uh, the shadowy guy, it's the same sort of thing where uh, Aurora uses Grimm in a sexual manner to get the Heart of Larklight and do all the curses. Whereas in Court of Thorns and Roses, the villain is using the uh, shadowy boy. So it's extremely similar. So you'd think that, yeah, like this is obviously inspired, but... Uh, Court of Thorns and Roses is 2015, and this book idea has apparently existed since 2012. And yeah, you would assume that despite Lightlark being what it is, uh, the author probably revised it over the years, and maybe those elements were added later. But actually, I don't think as much revision to like be influenced by Court of Thorns and Roses exists as you might think, because it being from 2012 makes an incredible amount of sense. So young adult fiction in the time of 2012 was dominated by Twilight-inspired paranormal romance and Hunger Games-inspired dystopia, with the paranormal romance genre starting to slightly die. It takes a bit for it to die. It's, it's slightly in its death throes, and dystopia is really taken off at this point and is a lot of it. And that's, that's what YA is at the time. It's really easy to forget that YA as we know it like is a direct result of those two books pretty much. Uh, it changed the genre and the market forever. Um, YA itself existed as an age group. It existed as a genre, but it did not exist in the same way before Twilight and the Hunger Games and books like that. Uh, it defined it much more in a marketing term and in sort of themes, styles, and everything like that. Those two books are the parents of the genre very much. And because those books were so popular and revolutionary, a lot of books then came out trying to cash in on it or inspired by it. Um, even today, Hunger Games is still used commonly for pitching new products because Hunger Games aged well. You don't see a lot of books describing themselves as Twilight meets XYZ. You do see books pitching themselves as Hunger Games meets XYZ because it's still such a popular, lasting cultural thing. In 2012, um, we are starting to see sort of some of the death throes. We start to see newer books coming out um, that do newer things because the cashing in on the trend thing is starting to die out a bit more. Like obviously in publishing, everything kind of takes longer and overlaps a lot more, but roughly, roughly. So in 2012, we get Shadow and Bone. Shadow and Bone was a successful trilogy. Um, I read it as a teenager, in fact, uh, but I honestly don't think it was as influential or important as it seems now. Uh, like it has a TV show and it sort of has really sparked it up. But I think that in 2015, we had Six of Crows. And Six of Crows was so the turning point for the Grishaverse books, which is Shadow and Bone, sparked renewed attention. Um, and 
Six of Crows in general was a really like it felt like a landmark book in YA because of how much influence it's also had since then. But Shadow and Bone did exist in 2012. That's when it came out. Um, And even though Shadow and Bone, again, I don't think it was a huge, huge success. It definitely had a fandom on like Tumblr and places like that. I was there. And Shadow and Bone always had the Darkling. So the Darkling is the villain of Shadow and Bone trilogy. And he's grim or really grim as him. So consider this too. Nightshade, for some reason, doesn't follow the naming convention of the other realms. If it did, it would be Nightling. It very easily could have been Darkling. It's so close. The Darkling is the, for those who haven't read Shadow and Bone or seen the TV show, um, the Darkling is the general of the army of people who have elemental magic powers. He's feared as he's the only person in the world who has spooky shadow powers, even though he's on the side of the other magic people and like a good guy. Uh, He comes from a long line of shadow people, his ancestor having caused a huge evil shadow ocean to open up. He is tall and pale with dark hair and he dresses sharply. He's um, older as well. I don't really remember what his age is supposed to be in the first book, but he very much feels like he's like, like 30 or something. Like 25 is probably too young uh yeah and he takes special attention to the young main character and uh, becomes a romantic interest promising her great power and the idea of ruling together um which is definitely much weirder in the first book because um in the tv show they age the characters up a fun fact about the darkling and that whole romance thing is that uh the main character shadow and bone is i'm quite certain 16 so that is a old guy who slowly becomes a romantic interest to the 16-year-old. But the twist is actually about the Darkling is that he is the villain. He is actually a 500-year-old or something, maybe older, a mortal with extreme power. He was using the main character for her powers and controlling her with lies and manipulation and false promises. Though this reveal breaks off their romantic connection, uh, there's still tension in the series after that point. Um, if, you know, maybe there's something there, you know, like, They're the only ones of their kind. She has special powers. He has special powers. You know, they're destined for each other. But are they? He was hot in the fandom. And I don't think it's an endgame spoiler to say the Darkling isn't the endgame romantic interest for Shadow and Bone after he's revealed as the main villain and all. But he was a huge influence on people wanting villain romances in young adult, being very, very into them. Um, You know, he's a good character overall. Uh, The trilogy is far from perfect. Uh, But he was overall kind of a good character, but the fandom, you know, just obsessed over him. They loved him. They wanted him to be endgame, and they wanted to just write and think so much about him and villain romances. And it's so easy to draw a direct line from him to Grimm. The difference is that the Darkling did war crimes and was a villain, though with, you know, some self-justified morals, they made him a bit more complex. And Grimm claims he did war crimes and claims he's a villain when all he does is creep around his girlfriend. So the notion that Lightlark was born partially as a direct result of the Darkling fandom is extremely likely to me. Royalty romance was also not as hot back in 2012, which sounds weird to say, but today, think about it, everybody worth, like, anybody that you're kissing, anybody in anything is a prince or a king or something. But Shadow and Bone notably had a blonde king love interest before it was cool. And... Okay, so this this all does feel very Shadow and Bone, but what about the Centennial? Take a second, if it hasn't occurred to you, to think about the Centennial. The curses, the realms, the color-specific outfits, the deadly games. Yeah, uh, Lightlark is heavily inspired by the dystopia boom and the Hunger Games, which was very much on people's minds in 2012 with the first novel being released, and it being, again, successful and a very talked-about genre and genre, book, whatever. The Centennial is a pretty bizarre event as it stands in the book right now. It's especially fixated on calling itself a game, a deadly game, lest we forget, despite me having to constantly point out it's objectively not deadly and it's not a game. The killing aspect is continuously discussed and feared despite never coming true. A small set of participants are trapped in a small, weird location. They must complete various games and worry about who to trust and making alliances. They have an audience pick, like watching them who pick sides and may help or harm them if they like a participant. Everyone comes from diverse locations which have one overarching tra- trait and can be defined by one color. 
it, it's it's extremely extremely a dystopia setup, a Hunger Games take. It doesn't fulfill any of those things, but these are all things the book promises to be and discusses like it's true. For example, Isla talks about alliances quite a lot, actually. But as the characters only exist when Isla is looking directly at them, there aren't any schemes or alliances or team-based drama. When everybody pairs up and she and Oro hang out, we hear nothing about even what Celeste is up to. I forget who she's paired with. I think she's paired with the Zool. And we hear literally nothing about what she's done. And that's like her best friend that she checks in and talks with all the time. Uh, you know, the audience thing, uh, most of the games are watched by people. So we do hear, I just called them games. Ugh. I've admitted they, they won, I just called them games. Most of the demonstrations, which is what they're called in the book, are watched by an audience. And the audience will cheer and support people. Um, but the audience doesn't actually matter or have a direct impact in any way, besides like one of the ones where they choose the winner. The audience is, yeah, it just sort of makes it seem more like it's a game or an event. And kind of, I guess, makes sense if you're going to do these things that the people who live on the island would see, I guess. But... Isla directly thinks, I don't have a direct quote, but I know that she says, because there's a reason, I, I double-checked this book so many times, I've had to look through it so many times. She says um, that the audience and the people who lived on the island would be important, and that things like um, winning them over would be an important thing, and that's exactly how it is in the Hunger Games with the audience. Except it doesn't come true. At all. At all in the book. It's unimportant. The audience never matters. The civilians never matter. There's one civilian in the book, and it's nothing. Look, the curses are very fantasy, sure, but very dystopian too. It's a bunch of societies defined by one overarching trait who have one large flaw they somehow can't address in a sensical way. You can't tell me a dystopia girl who is uniquely cursed and secretly special because she took the test and got a unique result isn't remarkably like Isla being uniquely cursed and secretly special because she is apparently born without powers. Likely, Sarah J. Maas in 2015 and books like Cruel Prince from around that time had effects on the book. Uh, we have to assume, too, that at some point Lightlark was edited and changed. I'm quite sure that TikTok, um, known for its obsession with like sex scenes and toxic romances, had a part in shaping the tropes that Grimm consists of. But the bones were clearly there in 2012 when 17-year-old Alex Astor was first writing this book. So why? 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 You might be wondering about me. You might be wondering, where do you get off? And uh, the answer to that is simple. I'm a sex repulsed asexual. I don't get off. But really, I, like, I'm not blind to the fact that this is going to be some sort of insanely long review. Um, at this point, it's less of a review and more of a personalized evisceration the length of a master's thesis. But you know, here's the thing. I, I read bad books, and this is a bad book. At some point, the tide has probably turned so completely on Lightlark that it's dead in the water. On the other hand, I have no idea. I sincerely doubt the fact it sold movie rights means we'll ever see it on screen or on TV. But I do hope that this review will be solely responsible for preventing that from happening. Like, if, if you saw this and you're involved in the film industry and this is the sole reason that you did not waste your money trying to adapt it, like, let, let me know. Let me, let me know, please. I love you. Uh, like, look, look. Okay. I don't actually have spite in the way that people think people who write negative reviews, especially long ones, are often perceived. Like, people think that when you write a negative review, especially about a book, that you are spiteful and jealous and you're doing it in the specific angry, stupid, you know, trolling way. And I hope that the length of this and the amount of detail and care and quotes and things proves that that's, that's not my take on this sort of thing, okay? I read bad books. This book made me laugh, incredulously, a lot. And I want to share that people that, yeah, I want to share that with people, with people I love, I have been, I've been talking about it with so many people out loud, just having a blast at the looks of confusion on their face. Like, it's a dumb, stupid, very bad book, and it's extremely silly. There's so much to talk about, I'm definitely forgetting. This review is, um, in word count, about 22,000 words. 23,000, I think, uh, and I will not have covered everything in the book, which is pretty wild. Uh, this review here as a video form, I don't know how long it's gonna be, because I haven't super looked at the files, but it's gonna be longer than the two hours it's estimated the reading takes. And I have spent more than two hours recording it because uh, 
well, it's taken me three days, and I'm likely going to re-record all of the beginning stuff because the audio and video was extremely bad. I've spent well over 24 hours writing the review. Um, well over. Mostly like 3am to 5am because I'm using a borrowed computer. I've spent so many hours discussing it with others, reading it, rereading it, taking constant notes. I am the world's foremost Lightlark scholar, and I probably know more about it than Alex Astor at this point. You know, this is not a petty, angry review. It is a petty, thorough, fact-based review. And let's be real, there's something about Lightlark that has to be addressed, and that made me keen to do this much and might be why I made it so long. Justified irritation. Lightlark sold because of a badly made TikTok, and it sold for more money than I will probably ever have in my life. An idea that the author refused to listen to critique about, stubbornly holding on to it until she got extremely lucky. She lives in New York City, bragging about the writer's life because she can coast on her extremely rich family and a golden parachute that has a golden parachute attached. And none of that would really be an issue if it was a good book or a mediocre book. But Lightlark is a bad book, and I read bad books. I don't like to bring myself and my personal things into reviews I write too much. Uh, you might note that I, I've said I quite a bit, but honestly, a lot of the stuff I read, I don't use the word I in my reviews. I try to say what it is, not my strict, strict personal opinion on things. The opinion's clear, but I try to back it up. But let me bring myself into this, okay? On the idea of privilege and luck and money and the cozy writer's dream in New York friggin' city that she's constantly making TikToks about, bragging about her movie rights and her success and her fans. Yeah, I mean, I did read this book out of a kind of spite, okay? Like, you might be right on that. A bit of jealousy, a bit of spite, because I cannot have that and I never will have that. I've been ill for years in bed, barely able to write, barely able to do most things. Even on the medication I'm on, I live mostly as a shut-in, disabled by my body. I have stuff that cannot be cured, I can only treat it, and it doesn't treat it well. I spend hours in random bursts of pain, and it's cut me out and changed my life totally, and it's not lovely, it's not great, you know? I, I write books. Um, growing up, I got praised only for my writing. I have a degree. I got a first in it. I got pretty much only extremely positive review in all of my writings, all of my workshops. And it never got me anywhere. Um, it doesn't get a lot of good writers anywhere, you know? It's, you know, I... The first book I ever wrote... Th this is almost, like, slightly bragging. But it's really not, because I can tell you. The first thing that um, I ever sold or wrote, and it's the only thing I've ever sold or wrote, I wrote when I was about 15. Um, did a bit of editing and sold to a publisher when I was about 17. It was published when I was 18. And I got paid for that. It wasn't a mainstream book. And I always hoped it would do pretty good, and it never did very good. It did better than I ever thought it would, I guess. But, you know, it never did too good. And that seems almost like your shot. Because in publishing, there's a lot of emphasis on debut authors, on your debut. Your debut as an author, not even into a specific genre. Your first book has to be the book that sells you. It you can circumvent it, people do, but it's almost always when you hear about a book, it's not by an author who's done writing before, unless they're an established author. A lot of people don't give authors a second chance. If their first book is a complete failure, they don't go anywhere. It's all about the debut. And here she's a debut. She got six figures of money for her book. And she comes from money. And you can do a lot with money. You can do a lot with money. So yeah, spite was involved. Maybe it's jealousy, you know? I didn't go in to hate it. Uh, I never do. If anything, I was sincerely worried when I heard about the drama around this book. I was worried I'd love it, and she'd win one more point over me again. But I did not, and she did not, and it's a bad book. And yeah, I read bad books.
figured that I should probably just, while I'm here, add one more thing on. Um, yeah, just basically to say, if you stuck here, watch the whole thing, just thank you for doing so. I realize it's a bit insane, but I, I just really had to talk about this. I'm going to move the microphone closer to me. And yeah, I mean, thank you. Uh, it's from a writing blog. This has just been me reading it with um, only a couple changes in there as I ramble a bit. My writing blog is crowdefeatsbooks.wordpress.com uh, or just on WordPress. You Google it, you find it, you know how this works. I am reading a lot more books now because I've recently gone on some nice new medications, basically. So I wrote a lot of books. I read a lot of really weird, obscure books. I read a lot of bad books. So if you liked what this review is, I'm not really likely ever going to do a video again. But you can find other shorter reviews there of some really quality classics. Uh, in addition, um, while I've held you hostage and you've endured this long, if you are interested in, I guess, checking out what I have to offer, like, for example, if you want to prove me wrong and be like, you clearly have no right to talk about Light Lark because, you know, you're just jealous and a bad author. I mean, I am an author, so I probably should self-promote myself for a hot second here. I don't do it very much because... In this day and age, authors have to become the product. We have to become consumable, and I'm not super interested in that. But I will briefly just... I mentioned them anyways. So this one here, uh, this is Angel Radio. Uh, my published name is A.M. Blauschild. If you look up any of my books, you'll just find it there. It's easier than me spelling my last name out. Uh, yeah, Angel Radio was my first book. I did mention that. Uh, the very first draft was when I was 15, and it was published when I was... 17. Well, 18 is when it came out, but I was 17 when I had to sign the contract. I had to get parental consent, which was quite funny because the publishers didn't know that I was a minor at the time. And it was kind of an awkward question where I was like, I had to email, can I still sign this contract if I'm a minor? And they had to get me a separate form giving parental consent. Uh, no, it was my first book. And it's, uh, you know, it, it was my first book, which was years ago at this point. Uh, but I, I still do like Angel Radio. I haven't read it in a very long time. I have a very poor memory, so I don't remember a lot of it. But it has a, um, a premise and plot that really has expanded and as I continue writing as a basis for a lot of things. So Angel Radio is about a girl um, named Erica. And one day, a bunch of really spooky angels descend from the sky. We're talking like... You know, people say biblically accurate, it's theologically accurate because they're not just from the Bible. But there's a bunch of spooky angels that ascend from the sky. They're all eyes and wings and claws and they're just monstrous, horrific, elderic beings. And they descend from the sky and they kill pretty much every single person in the world except her. They take the bodies away for unknown purposes and they give her no answers. They just don't engage with her, they don't interact with her. And she is alone in Vermont for a couple months until one day she hears a radio signal of what seem to be other survivors. And so she sets out on this journey up through Vermont in this sort of strange, empty, alien apocalypse of angels, trying to find answers, trying to find out why she was the only one saved. And yeah, it's um, it's a young adult adventure book. Uh, I would definitely call it a bit more young adult than just sort of the horror. If I wrote it now, I would have gone a lot more heavy into the horror as it stands. It's much more of like a light young adult book. It's completely appropriate for um, teen readers of pretty young ages. I don't even think there's pretty much anything strong in there besides just like some body horror spooky angel stuff. So it's quite fun. Um, the other thing that I have is uh, my duology, which is good angel. And over here we can see bad end, except this is how you should hold them. So uh, good angel and bad end are my beloved little book trilogies here, duologies. Ignore the fact that my tongue is quite tired from just the amount of work that this whole review, and this is what Light Lark does to a man, I don't know what to tell you. So, Good Angel, Bad End is a, um, it's kind of young adult, it's slightly more young adult, or even, you know, let's try to break away from the constraining genre. Um, but yeah, no, it's it's appropriate for young adults, but of a, like more of a 15 uh, is about the youngest of the age group, because there's some more violence, quite strong violence, strong language, there's some sexual content in there. So, you know, it's a bit more for mature, but it's not like super explicit in most ways. Uh, Good Angel is um, basically the story of a angel. Uh, she is completely newly created from heaven. 
and uh, she is going to a sort of magical university, which sounds really fun and whimsical, and it sort of starts as fun and whimsical. It's a world where I decided I wanted to explore a lot of ideas about angels and demons, interacting, the culture, the society of angels and demons, like just really have fun. When I first started writing it, I basically was tired of how I'd been writing for a bit, and I said, I want to write something that's just for me, and I hope other people will like it, but it will just be something that has everything I want and everything I want to do and what I want to talk about. And what it is, is this um, starting out sort of fun and cute, like, university, and she winds up befriending a bullied demon, and it's, oh, it's a forbidden friendship. And it turns out, however, that that might have kickstarted the apocalypse. And the duology is very much about the end of the world. It grows increasingly darker, but also it's a very hopeful story. It's about how the end of the world might not actually be the end of the world. And that's sort of a message that um, came out before certain more recent events, but it felt very relevant at the time and it still is. It's, it's sort of just, it's a hopeful story about friendship. Um, there's no real romance in it. There's a lot of LGBT rep of like every single kind out there. Um, and yeah, I'm not doing the best pitch on it. I don't usually give a lot of pitches on it, but I consider it a really fun book. I'm extremely proud of it. If you're a fan of things like Good Omens, especially, obviously it was a huge inspiration because I was a big fan as a kid. Uh, you know, The Good Place, a lot of things with the word good in them. I would really recommend trying Good Angel, you know? it's. I think it's a good book. And honestly, again, if you want to do it out of spite because you think that I have no right to talk about a good book with good plotting and world building, uh, come at me, okay? But no, seriously, like, thank you so much for presumably apparently watching all of this or skipping to the end and catching the fun bit where I just ramble a bit about books that I've written. Yep, yeah, um, again. Light Larka. Light Larka. Yeah, yeah, Light Larka. Mm, yeah, mm. <laughs>